I just want someone to have that visual experience. I think, um, I mean, as much as I love titles and feel they're important, I think some of the writing that's where people are almost making paintings to justify their writing mm -hmm. that you see in a lot of, you know, a lot of different programs and out kind of in the art world. Right. And then you read the statement, it doesn't seem like it has any connection to the paintings and that right, right. sort of world that exists. Hey guys, this is Waiting Dry. I'm Josh Lawyer. I'm Dylan Doe Lawyer. And today we have our guest is Joshua Flint. Or Josh Flint. Do you go by either or? Josh is fine, yeah. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> awesome name, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, we secretly have a club that where we meet and plan to end the, you know, end the world at some point. So, Did you ever notice that there's not a Josh in a position of power in any... <laughs> government or corporation if you think about it can you think of a really well-known famous josh <laughs> there's no yeah. president that's been a josh right so i, th I kind of find i find that kind of interesting well, that yeah. is funny even the, the the name joshua is like a mm -hmm. biblical name and he was the guy that took over after moses died mm -hmm. bullshit <laughs> why wasn't he in power to begin with which also Joshua too is is a derivation of Yahweh, right? Yeah, which yeah. means God, right? Which is sort of yep. interesting. Yeah, I always think of Josh as like a casual name. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. It's like, do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Like, like the person is casual. Yeah, like I always think that the person's going to be pretty like, Appro but that's probably just because I'm. Yeah, probably, uh -huh. but I'm probably just because it's like. Because yeah, we're, we're pretty cool. <laughs> I would say, yeah, you you hit the nail on the head there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What else are, makes us great? <laughs> all Joshes are the same. We're yeah. just like, we're awesome. No, it, it is rare, though. I mean, I think, you know, like I was saying, like, I don't know of like a 65-year-old guy named Josh. Yeah, I've never come true. across one. So I think maybe it's something generational there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Did you grow up uh, religious? No. No. Not uh, at all. Yeah. yeah I, I find you know, there's like names that seem to be attached to and I find a decent amount of Josh's group religious. Mm -hmm. so. Also that you knew the Yahweh fact, mm -hmm. which is. That's just because I'm interested in history and yeah. a lot of other Hell subjects. Yeah. yeah. So uh, thanks for doing this, by the way. I've already said that off mm -hmm. air, but thanks again. We're in Portland uh, for the next couple of days and we're able to get you, which was awesome. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, big thanks to Sergio for uh, pointing me in your direction which worked out awesomely. I, I use the word awesome to describe a lot of things, mm -hmm. obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so uh, you you were born, in, you said in California? Yeah, Central Valley. Nice. Yeah. Uh, how'd you like it there? I mean, it's like all the little kid stuff you remember in terms uh -huh. of like running around in a pasture or visiting your grandparents and kind right. of like the natural world versus specific homes <laughs> or... Other things, I mean, I have a few memories, like distinct memories from there, but nothing, I'm not like someone who can recall, oh, this happened to me in fifth grade in Mrs. Mm. Whatever's class. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't, you know, I don't know, maybe it's moving around a lot. I don't have those like connectors yeah, yeah. Um, to like conjure the memory. Yeah, I moved around a lot, but I'm oddly the opposite. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, I remember like this dumb detail that <laughs> I wish I could take away from my brain to store <laughs> more important things mm -hmm. uh that's cool so that's just like childhood mm -hmm. yeah and then so you as far as like you were you were saying earlier you had like four specific homes mm -hmm. and you've been in portland since to early 2013 2013 and then okay. there were two years when my wife and i moved to raleigh north carolina oh, and that was nice. like 2009 2011 mm -hmm. and that was for her grad school i nice. saw you like it out there i enjoyed it yeah, yeah. The, the south was very uh like i had a lot of really good just impromptu conversations with people like huh. that the the act of conversation like casual conversation seems to be alive there which i found very endearing mm -hmm. um do you find it to be different on the west coast as far as the um 
I, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I think that it's very casual up here in Portland, uh -huh. you know? I think there's maybe a little more passive aggressiveness on the West Coast in uh -huh. general. And I think people on the East Coast are a little more direct, which I like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? I No, I do agree. I think that, like, one thing living in Santa Rosa that you kind of realize is that people ha kind of have their groups of friends and stuff like that. And it's yeah. like, you don't see people venturing out from it very much. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you can strike, a co strike up a conversation with somebody, but for the most part, people are, like, stuck to their... Mm -hmm. It's almost groups. weird if you try to talk to someone. It's almost like offensive or something. I don't know how to explain it. It's it's like, uh, do I know you? Yeah. Um, mentality. And you're mm -hmm. like, I'm not. I'm just trying to talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Be friendly. Yeah. 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 People in Portland are very friendly. Yeah. You know that, which is nice. You know, but I, I think there's still a little bit of what you were discussing, MJ, in terms of um, groups being sort of tight knit, and mm -hmm. I think that may be a function of age as well. I don't yeah. know how old you two are, but I'm certainly. Like, you know, as you get older, it's a little harder to establish friendships, you know. For sure. Yeah. So. Yeah, I've lived in Santa Rosa for like five years and I feel like I'm just getting friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, cool. Mm -hmm. it takes me five years now. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's awesome. So, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Is that good enough for the tr the background? <laughs> <laughs> Moving around. You can clean it all up and post. It's <laughs> <Yeah>. fine. <laughs> The, so you, you told us earlier you went to school at the Academy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Academy of Art in San Francisco. And did you study yeah. fine arts there? No, I studied traditional illustration. Oh, uh -huh. They're supposed to have an awesome illustration program, right? They do. I mean, I looked I looked at the Art Institute of... of what is the other one in San Francisco? There's CCA. The Art Institute. Well, that was in Oakland. Oh, right, correct? right, right, right. Yeah. The, the other one, the Art Institute of San Francisco, uh -huh. maybe? There's some... Yeah, AI. You know, a, yeah. Yeah. Um, and just felt that the academy focused on drawing and painting, which is, I didn't know quite what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, I just knew I wanted to get better at drawing and painting. Mm. Yeah. And then whatever opened up afterwards sort of would open up. For sure. How'd yeah. you like that experience? It was good. I mean, it was very rigorous. Yeah. I mean, I didn't do anything really um, outside of just paint, mm -hmm. you know, and, and learn to draw and come to grips with getting a certain quality in terms of like seeing the natural world or the real world and sort of painting that and getting a certain result, you know, and kind right. of having that level of ambition at first beyond moving any other direction. Yeah. To yeah. like learn the, learn the fundamentals and then push it from there. And, For sure. And I still think I'm, you know, as like a, I'm, I feel like a perpetual student yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so I think that's one of the benefits of being an artist in general is mm -hmm. certainly the ability to continuously learn mm -hmm. i find like a lot of artists and for the most part that's kind of why you've you've gone that direction is just because you're not a person who could like lick envelopes all day long mm -hmm. Do you know what i mean it's mm -hmm. it's it's which it must be an amazing <laughs> job by the way <laughs> <laughs> yeah it must be great um uh, great 401k uh but it is that like that ability or that th that like the boredom that kind of of a tedious or a monotonous job that kind of isn't made for most artists mm -hmm. it's the the challenge of figuring out the problem and solving it um uh, at that moment in time yeah uh when you left the, the or I guess a better question is, so from like learning the fundamentals, um, the learning part, at least for me, seems to be the development of how, of, of I guess style is kind of the, the most summed up word of mm -hmm. how to say what I want to say or do what I want to do or whatever. And that kind of seems to be the... I don't know the forever learning part is, mm -hmm. is if you could sum it up into one word being style, I guess, mm -hmm. which also at the same time, I hate that word. Yeah. I think it does carry like a negative yeah, connotation yeah. a little. I, I kind of think about visual approach mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and like, what are your, what's your visual approach? And then that starts to inform why, why you're picking and choosing certain things. Right. Um, and of course, don't get me wrong. I use the word style, yeah, yeah. in class with some of my students mm -hmm. and it's sort of right there's a there's sort of a it carries with it s something surface right. level versus like the underlying sort yeah. of I've, I've found that most things in life that kind of carry that negative connotation are based around the people who seem to have abused that thing 
So, you know, uh, f- flames on t-shirts <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, or like the, 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 I don't know, douchebaggery of the, of the person who's like using it is like, oh, well they ruined that for mm-hmm. all of us. Mm-hmm. It's like parents using slang or something like that. It's mm-hmm. like, it's like, all right, well I can't use that word anymore. It's gone forever. And I think style is one of those things or it's been attached to too many things that kind of are on that service level are kind of focusing on like, that's my style. That's me. That's, mm-hmm. you know, and then to most artists, that's kind of like, all right, like, um, I don't want to be that. Well, I also think that one of the issues with style is that there's people that are focusing on it too much where I you like on Instagram and social media you just see people asking how do you develop your style right. it's like I don't even I don't even consider having a style it's more like you said like this is how I want to express myself visually where people are focusing and trying to hone in on that before figuring out what they want to say or reasons behind choices so mm-hmm. I think that's that's one of the most negative things because then people also attack each other for stealing each other's style mm-hmm. and it's it may or may not uh, be true because there are, you know, people that develop certain characteristics that are very specific to that person. And, you know, people, uh, there are certain people who are stealing it and other people who are not. So it's, I understand like the, the negative connotation behind it as well. For sure. Yeah. Style seems like what's attached to it <coughs> is, um, fad in a way because right. it's used so much with clothing, you know, mm-hmm. this year's style, this, falls style etc right um and so it seems like it's constantly changing and sort of movable whereas someone's visual approach in painting um even if you are stealing from another artist in a sense or, or sort of trying to do something that they're doing there's still a lot of dedication to figure that out and mm-hmm. i think you're always going to like the length of my arm is different than your arm or the right. person I'm trying to steal and the way I move my hand mm-hmm. and the and sort of the touch and the dexterity that I use is so different right, that eventually, sure. hopefully, that just changes and that mm-hmm. person, whoever it is, brings something else new to the right. that sort of visual approach that they're they're sort of developing mm-hmm. or mimicking of some sort. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's I always think of I mean, I don't, we might have just talked about this in the last episode, but the idea of style being just kind of like your habits you've built Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you can't influence that based around being inspired by others works. But I think it's like an entire, uh, you know, career, uh, built on top of like the inspiration is just kind of being put on top of your entire career of being inspired and building those habits. And there's I think after doing it for so long, there's no way that you can't kind of have your own hand into a style, even if you are highly influenced by someone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you have to. I mean, I think that that's inevitable. If if that person stays with with it and doesn't just switch gears into something different. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've seen plenty of illustrators or artists do something for five or six years, and then it's looking or falling in line with some other things you see out there Mm -hmm. and then they switch gears and it's, you know, maybe they're going into a different field, et cetera. Yeah. No, I think just like I got my friends in art school from just who was sticking around the classes. Mm -hmm. You know, we would have 20, 30 students in class and then by the end of the term, it would be whittled down to like 12 or 15. And then I'd be like, oh, you're still here. You're still here. (laughs) You know, Um, and that's kind of how you know, it'd be a lot of people who would just fall off. For and sure. You, you see who's like dedicated and willing to, to put in the work. Yeah. Do you notice that pattern in your classes as well? Well. Or like at your school? You teach, by I the do. way. <laughs> I do. I do teach. <laughs> um, What's the school again? The Pacific Northwest College of Art. Okay. PNCA. Um, maybe not as much as I saw in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And I think maybe because of the big city and you mm-hmm. have a lot of people dipping their toes in the waters of what's what creativity is mm-hmm. or what art school could be like for a whole wide variety of reasons. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, I think maybe you do have that natural rotation in and out just to like check it out. And for a lot of people, it just doesn't work. Right. Um, 
yeah, a lot of, you know, raves were huge in the early 2000s and the late <laughs> right. 90s in San Francisco. Right. A lot of students showing up looking like they just came from a rave or that's all that, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and then you would, wouldn't see them the following term or the next year or what have For you. Sure. And, and I've seen some incredibly good artists who I'd look over and just be like, you're killing it compared to me. Right. And then you would just never, after, you know, you wouldn't see him and like just drop yeah. out in the middle of the class. even. That's always you, bizarre. Yeah. Like we have that one there. Well, God, I don't remember her name. Michelle Fong or something like that. She's a, a local San Francisco artist who was killing it for a while. Like, doing really really good work and she just quit to become a baker like mm -hmm. she's like i'm not doing art anymore i'm doing yeah. baking yeah i think that's great you you there's a creativity that crosses over there mm -hmm. so it's like that you found you know maybe baking is that medium that translates well for her brain you for know? sure it's also it's a it's a clearer path you know art is just that's very true tough mm -hmm. you, you there's a part of it that you have to kind of just figure out for you mm -hmm. there's no path that right. everyone set out where you're like follow this and you will succeed it's mm -hmm. just you personally have to figure out based off of what you love in art how to get to a, like to an area where you can live off of that mm -hmm. and it might have overlapping similarities to this person or that person but for the most part there's no clear path no and i think that after a while that may definitely scare off people yeah. because they're just maybe they're hitting a wall or they have one or two bad experiences and they mm -hmm. think that this is how it is for sure as opposed to i mean i guess i've been doing it sort of long enough and i do a lot of research and i look at what's going on in in europe and in asia to just you know find out what's going on out there because right. there's a lot of interesting things sort of culturally happening that people are bringing to to art in general mm -hmm. um and you do realize that there's so many levels of an art world there's not right. just one art world right. and we're all in it it's like there's overlapping spheres of art worlds that right. you can be a part of yeah yeah um it's like a venn diagram you know mm -hmm. um and so that takes a while to figure out after school of like what am i doing where do i want to be where do i want to go mm -hmm. and those are all important questions to ask yourself in order to kind of end up at least edging or moving in the directions of that yeah. that space mm -hmm. that you sort of admire you feel like your work fits in or, mm -hmm. or what right. have you and even at some point you might reevaluate that path and go like i thought that when i was younger but mm -hmm. right. now that i'm a little older mm -hmm. i kind of see this mm -hmm. being a thing that i would much rather do and enjoy as as far as like workflow even you mm -hmm. know like i my personality lends itself to yes i don't know designing t-shirts or something like that. You know i mean mm -hmm. it's 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 have, mm. have I to turn the to turn, turn the tables here and ask yeah. you these questions have either of you two had to to sort of evaluate things and make a little bit of a shift or just kind of put away some area that you were working in to to know that that's not quite the right spot and you need to find another avenue to where you want to be well I think recently what we at least for me and I'm I think kind of for Josh is what we've been trying to step away from galleries mm -hmm. so much because I think when you're starting out you see all these people getting into galleries or selling out shows or you feel like that's like, okay, this means success. Getting into this mm -hmm. gallery means success or getting this show means you're, you're on your way up. Mm -hmm. But as you get some of those things in your pocket, you realize, wait a second, that, that doesn't mean success. There's way more that goes into this. So mm -hmm. it's like reevaluating that. And this is yeah. actually recent because it's like, we've been doing this for years mm -hmm. and as we get more and more serious about, you know, doing it full time as opposed to having, you know, jobs that pay the bills and mm -hmm. doing this after, um, you realize like you do the math. I'm very like analytical, like you, I'll look stuff up. I'll like sit down and do math. It's like, okay, this person had a solo show here, sold out, made 20 grand, maybe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 20 grand isn't enough to live on for a year. Right. So it's like, and you, you worked on that show for a year, a year mm -hmm. and a half, maybe half a year if you're fast. Mm -hmm. It's like, all right, well, if you can do it in half a year, that's 40000 if you sell out both shows. But, that's, it's like, that's, but we live that's, in California. Yeah. yeah, yes, you do. <laughs> yeah, like that's, that's not a big chunk of money. No, I mean, I think there's a, you know, I've, I've never sold out a show, mm -hmm. and I've been an artist who's sort of made my way mm -hmm. for the last you know, 
17, 18 years or so. Mm-hmm. Um, and that ha, finding good people to work with beyond just having solo shows and, and selling. I mean, in terms right. of having galleries that where you can give them work and then they can just sell it off their walls or they mm-hmm. have a client list that they send it to. So if you send a couple of paintings, they're going to instantly get a hold of some of the people who really enjoy your work. Right. Um, and those things to fill in the gaps. Right. You yeah, know, yeah. and I think that, um, yeah, I mean, I, I have some really wonderful relationships with the galleries I have and, and they're terrific and, um, but I'm always sort of looking at new avenues constantly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I certainly, my my approach has been sort of working with the great people that I've sort of found and then always trying to put my work each year into some new space. Mm-hmm. Right. And so some of those take and some of those d- don't. But mm-hmm. um, getting new eyes in front of your paintings and getting new people to just give you feedback i mm-hmm. think is important as well for sure um and every every avenue you try has a little bit of different on that chart yeah. of like maybe this gallery gives me a lot more feedback about mm-hmm. specific paintings and why and this gallery they seem to be happy with everything and are just like do what you do right. and we'll take it and we'll just see kind of how it falls um so some of that you know you may need some of that at different points in your career, you know? For sure. I've certainly felt that where I would send stuff and be like, hey, I want a little more critical feedback here mm-hmm. about what I'm doing and why, and is this going off the rails over here? Or is this functioning well? Um, so I can just get a little insight and marry it or match it up to what I think Yeah. in terms of how the work's functioning. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think it's it's almost like you have like for for me it's like i think of it as like i have like a, almost like a home gallery where i'm able to kind of explore more mm-hmm. and they're more open to that they're more okay with me going like i know this is what i'm what i'm most known for but i want to go this direction and them kind of you want to find a home where they they embrace that and they let you work out cuz those ideas might take a long time to work out before they can kind of see what you what's in your mind of the direction you're trying to go because just because I'm going in this direction doesn't mean I'm good off the bat but then having it go into different pockets where they kind of have to live and die on that wall and and you don't know who's there it, it kind of reminds me of like comedians do similar things you know they work out all their material at like a home base uh like a uh comedy like um, club or club venue. there, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and then they go and they once they've kind of fine tuned it, they can like spread it out to like theaters or wherever they're showing, and mm-hmm. and for the most part it's worked out. But it also depends on the crowd as well. Like the the viewer does have some kind of you know say into if it's good or not, and, it, and that sometimes depends on the environment they grew up in. Mm-hmm. So yeah, everyone's going to bring what their lived experiences to your painting, yeah. which is great. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you mentioned comedy podcasts, and I certainly listen to plenty of podcasts in general, just mm-hmm. as the creative ones. Right. Um, and really finding how much overlap is if someone's doing like a screenwriter For sure. or a comedian or a visual artist or mm-hmm. singer. an installation artist or singer or yeah. whatever it is. Um, I've just found more and more overlap than I ever sort of thought like was similarities. possible. Yeah, in just terms of the the how do you break open an idea and then push it forward right. and, and what has merit and what doesn't and why. Mm-hmm. And yeah. you know, I certainly learn plenty from from folks who aren't visual artists mm-hmm. for sure, you know. And that's that's to me it's just like that's free information you have access to and that's yeah. and also, you know, you have to ask yourself some days like when you walk in the studio, what's, what's the painting there for? Right. And, and, you know, maybe you just need a companion that day and that's, <laughs> that's what it is. You yeah. know, that yeah. is what it is for the day and it doesn't need to move beyond those walls and it can just be something that's, that's, that connects you to yourself and that you can push forward and maybe another great idea comes out of that. Mm. Yeah, so, for sure. I mean, I certainly work in a lot of different approaches just to, you know, I'm never thinking about 
putting out a product, I'm always thinking about process. Mm -hmm. And so I, I try a lot of different approaches just because it seems to suit my nature. So mm -hmm. painting totally from my head. Mm -hmm. oh, you don't use reference? Sometimes I do. I mean, certainly, I mean, I think it's, it's clear I use reference mm -hmm. and I like mm -hmm. to use reference. Um, but there are certainly, you know, in the last three, four years where there's large parts of paintings where I am For painting sure. from my head or maybe I've looked through a book on plants and then I just remember I start laying a plant in there or a bird mm -hmm. or something or you know, right. some element that's in the painting and just sort of paint it from my head. And mm -hmm. if I can get it right. to live in that space that I've established, then I'm, you know, that's like a little victory there. Oh, um, that's cool. You know, because I've definitely spun my wheels looking for the right reference right. and <coughs> just been like, well, I just spent two hours. There's even stuff like um, there's one uh, of your pieces I really like where there's like, I don't know, this snake looking monster like monster mm -hmm. or octopus. Mm -hmm. I don't know how mm -hmm. you would explain it, but it's like this blue glowing thing mm -hmm. in a box. And obviously you're not going to find a reference for that. But oh, I, I know exactly. no, I mean, I, that's definitely um yeah, I mean, I was looking at it. It's like we have access to these things and we're, we're pulling from all over, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I have friends who are like in the video game industry and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So I'm looking at visual effects artists and I'm mm -hmm. looking at, at 3D designers because I've done a, a, a smidgen of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so you try to know what's really possible. So right. it's like I'm making my own version of maybe something I've seen out there. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. and because I'm trying to, I'm trying to build this concept that there is no direct reference for, and looking just helps right. bring it together. Mm -hmm. um, so often, if I see something, it's like I'm remixing plenty of copyrighted and non-copyrighted reference, but you would never know it. Right. right, you know, I mean, it, in terms of how it's being used and pushed and pulled and in um, you know, I'm intentionally changing things. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it just gets so devoid of the, of its source material mm -hmm. that I sort of try to make it my own always. Right. Are you super, uh, are you super, what's the word, inspired by film? Yeah, certainly. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I'm a big cinephile for sure. Yeah. Because I, I'm looking at the one right now. I mentioned it when you sat down is the birds going into the mouth. Uh huh. And those are so like I was taught. We had a photo shoot earlier today and I was trying to explain to the model the direction that I want to go where it's like I want it to be a dark fantasy. Mm -hmm. And that's what your right. stuff reminds me mm. of. It's like Pan's Labyrinth is my favorite movie. And it's like this beautiful, horrid like film where it's like so and not that your stuff is horrid but it mm -hmm. looks almost like a dark fantasy mm -hmm. you know it's got that feel to it so i'm just curious if like what mm -hmm. film if you're into horror if you're i think i'm just inspired. into film i mean there's mm -hmm. plenty of times i'll watch a movie that's panned by critics or rotten tomatoes or something and i'm i'm looking at it strictly from a visual standpoint mm -hmm. because i know two or three hundred people have been involved to to bring that world to life and right. that's you know i'm also bringing worlds to life and so it's just right. to me i can get yeah i'm, I'm not analyzing the story i'm not mm -hmm. trying to break it down mm -hmm. in some sort of narrative etc there's plot holes great i don't really care I, mm -hmm. I mean i will look at you know wonderful aesthetic lauded film like andre tarkovsky or look at I mean, what was a, I'm trying to think of a movie I watched recently that was just for like, you're bringing this world to life and mm -hmm. it's impressive. Um, is it usually fantasy? Not always, but certainly that's, you know, the way motion graphics have evolved. Mm -hmm. You know, they used to be, like when the matrix came out, they could do only those things at night or in like mm -hmm. dark darkness. Cause it just wouldn't read to our eye and it clearly seemed false. Right. Now they can do everything in the middle of a bright sunshine day, which was very difficult. Mm -hmm. So just having, you know, I went to school for, for traditional illustration. And then my junior senior year, I really gravitated towards painting. Mm -hmm. Um, and I thought I would work in the movie industry. That's exactly how Sergio. Um, and then the dot coms blew up in like 2002 mm -hmm. and that really affected the Bay area. Right. So when I was getting out of school, 
you know, I had a couple of different types of portfolios I was looking to use as my next stepping stone. Mm -hmm. um, and I was going into interviews for very entry level jobs. And there would be someone who had gone in before me who had 10 years experience in the industry. Yeah. Right. So. And this was for movie stuff? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, so this would be. Storyboard or? anything uh, for sure. like i said in terms of i just wanted to learn to draw and paint and then its mm. application yeah. would be flexible based on you know concept and idea and format and, and all that there there is a part of your work that does seem almost like it is trying to capture i don't know it, it, like pan's labyrinth a good example of mm. like or something like that where like there, del Toro type the thing. aesthetic of the most of the figures feel like it's from a it's dated like it's from an older time mm -hmm. but then there seems to be little parts not maybe not necessarily beat you over the head or anything like that like like the most um obvious one is kind of like that snake monster for mm -hmm. me but there mm -hmm. are things in your other work where it's it's just um a modern feel or something like that and it kind of adds this like weird um we're not allowed to say juxtapose on this <laughs> Uh, tension podcast is yeah. tension a good word <laughs> sure. I, I like tension <laughs> no i think that that so i think a part of owning in a way kind of owning my career path and maybe breaking off the shackles of like this really what i felt a very rigid sort of system with illustration mm -hmm. through that school through the academy especially i just felt i needed to shake sort of free of that so mm -hmm. i didn't want to have model sessions um, mm -hmm. because I felt too beholden to the imagery I was creating. Mm -hmm. And I felt that when I found photographs um, or used things that I didn't create, I just felt so much more freedom to kind of own it and mm -hmm. push it in a direction that, that ultimately where I felt it needed to go. I totally um, understand that. And so that was, that was also me being young and kind of pushing back against you know, I'm going to be a gallery painter now, kind of a attitude versus mm -hmm. like being a, a more of a commercial artist and, and what is that and why. Right. Um, and also just looking at people I really admire and, and seeing that, you know, some of my favorite painters, they're painting from their head and I, and don't use reference and I mm -hmm. am stunned at, at their capacity to do that. Mm -hmm. I'll never be able to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but at least I can sort of work work in that direction mm -hmm. right yeah. so um yes a little bit of inventiveness a little bit of reference mm -hmm. you know looking mm -hmm. around and trying to use any resource i can mm -hmm. to sort of get yeah. the desired result that kind of old-timey look is that is that intentional for something you're kind of trying to pull out in the viewer uh or is that just something that appeals to you or like, i know you you've painted like a lot of pilots like, mm -hmm. like uh, portraits, right? And uh, yeah. yeah, there's and some re a recent little series I was sort of working yeah. on. And, yeah. and all of them seem like, you know, like they could easily be like World War II pilots yeah. or something like that. Yeah. But there is that, you know, feel of, I mean, one of the benefits of kind of painting and the, the, that aesthetic is, is it's almost instantly, you know, by putting goggles on someone's head, you know they're a pilot, mm -hmm. funny enough, where mm -hmm. like, if I painted a modern day pilot, I would assume he would just look like a guy. Mm -hmm. You might be able to swing, like put some wings on his like chest, like those little like pins. And mm -hmm. that would be the only indicator of, of that person. There's yeah. less of a uniform, I guess nowadays to kind of imply narrative. Um, yeah. I mean, I think if you would look at, I mean, may I, and I haven't, but in terms of my guess would be if you looked at, at modern day pilots, they'd be very militaristic and mm -hmm. a little strange maybe in terms of even like, like more towards like NASA astronauts perhaps, I, you mm -hmm. know, in terms of, if, in terms of the stuff that goes on their face and, right, of, yeah. you know, technology's changed so much. So of course there's going to be these updates. Right. Um, but I mean, back to your point about using, I mean, I really do... I've built sort of an archive of imagery that I find across the internet mm -hmm. in vintage shops. I mean, my wife will give me imagery or, or take, you know, photographs. I'll be like, hey, mm -hmm. shoot, you know, send that over to me because that, that has some promise or whatever. So I just sort of built these folders um, 
and I just look through them and I, I'm pulling, sometimes it's very direction, direction based the, of imagery that I'm pulling in terms mm-hmm. of these specific topics that I want to have a database for. Um, sometimes I just sort of open up and we'll look for a few hours and gather imp- images and just kind of put them all in a folder and, and I'll look back through mm-hmm. and find something that for some reason connects that, that sort of resonates with me. Right. Um, and then usually, I mean, I guess we're kind of getting into a little bit of process in addition to sort of the whys. Um, mm-hmm. And then usually through reading something like literature, poetry, mm-hmm. nature writing, science, anthropology, some, you know, I'm usually reading a lot of those different types of topics. Uh-huh. Um, and then through them, maybe I'll think of an image that I've that sticks out, and then right. there'll be an idea that sort of I glimpse. Huh. And then I'll, you know, a lot. I have a lot of post-it notes and scribbles sure. that I just sort of do yeah. constantly, and I leave them in a box at my studio. I have them in a drawer at my house, and I just sort of generate these ideas, and then some will really stick, mm-hmm. and then that's where I'll go develop further. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll use Photoshop sometimes to sort of get me moving in the right direction. Other times I go right to Canvas and then we'll maybe shift back to some digital tools or maybe I just gather what I need and then I'm changing it and evolving the imagery as I'm going mm-hmm. in the painting. Um, but it's usually through the sort of the spark is usually through reading topics that I really enjoy that I feel sort of speaks to the broader um, umbrella that my painting sort of fits under, I feel, uh-huh. in terms of, you mentioned, like, I'm a huge um, fan. I mean, it's sort of a silly word, but in terms of someone who who's very much interested in history, very much into right. sort of time periods, um, very much interested in sort of earth and earth sciences and all these things. I'm interested right. in religion, back to sort of a point you had earlier, mm-hmm. um, based on how people are just observing organizing and figuring out their world Uh and what did they lean on you know i mean i think that ultimately the my painting's coming from the fact that we live in a secret right like nobody knows exactly nobody knows the answer yeah we live in a secret and so through science or religion or some other areas people have tried to figure it out or say they've come up with solutions to maybe make them feel better Mm -hmm. Uh i'm not looking to be assuaged I find it very mysterious and fascinating and, and that there isn't a final understanding of everything. Mm-hmm. I find that very enticing and engaging. Mm-hmm. Other people may find that very fearful. Right. I see. I, so, uh, and I've always just felt this way since I was a little kid, you know, yeah. running around in the forest a lot, feeling strange, you know, just sort of running in the forest and feeling very free and like strange and, and sort of that's always sort of been with me. Mm-hmm. And then as you get older, you see how different religions around the world have sort of wrapped their head around what we're doing and why. Right. You know, none of that to me has been very convincing. For yeah. sure. Um, Did you grow up, was your family religious at all and you just kind of strayed away from it? They were, well, and it, I know so little about religion. I couldn't even tell you where this falls on like the scale of Christianity. But in terms of they were Presbyterian. Okay. So I think that's a pretty open, mm-hmm. accepting you know, kind of everyone can have the you know the less less ritual I would mm-hmm. say than mm-hmm. than others, um, and you know I, when I was twelve or thirteen, I just kind of explained to them why it wasn't for me, and and my parents were okay with that, even mm-hmm. though maybe they were a little bit more active in some of the churches that we right. we were at, um, and they found a lot of value in it for a while, and then you know after a while they they found less value based on on that circle, you know, mm-hmm. for sure, um, and they're open to just doing their own thing but still having those beliefs you know versus mm. it being like a rigid kind of yeah more of a, <clears throat> a more strict sort of interpretation or right. or ritual or community of you know ethics or whatever For sure. so you know what's crazy is like i'm not religious anymore but i grew up religious and i remember when i was little thinking that you know because we grew up catholic thinking that the stories didn't make sense and also it instilled a huge fear. Like mm-hmm. like the stories like frightened me. Mm-hmm. And church, even to this day, ever since I was little, it frightens me. 
Yeah, that's not a good thing, right? I don't know why. It's like there's something <clears throat> ominous about churches. Like, well, it's also like the main selling point is so you don't go to hell. I mean, that's kind of like the big, like, when you die, you'll go to hell. I know, it's a It's kind of a thing. big fear that's a big selling point in religion in general is the afterlife. Mm-hmm. Is that big unknown, you know, that kind of like secret or whatever you want. That seems one of the biggest ones as far as religion is concerned and secrets is mm-hmm. the after you die, what's next? But mm-hmm. then there was also like this monster who's the devil, right? Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. that was terrifying Shout to out. me. You know, it was like, yeah, it's just kind it, of interesting. Yeah. Uh, that's when I was in high school, our school was actually really good about bringing in more college sort of level classes. Um, and they ran a whole, which was, I think, sort of unique for a high school, is they ran a whole year on religions from around the world. And I took this class, and it was mm-hmm. very much like a college sort of based class. Um, and so we had priests come in of all, di- of all wow. disciplines, and, and we had Sikhs and mm-hmm. Buddhists mm-hmm. and a whole wide variety of, of individuals with their religions come in and talk to us. And then we also went to, there's a big Sikh community outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So we went there and just sort of saw, you know, how they ran their life, what they believed in and Mm -hmm. why. And that just kind of made me realize that all of them, all of them say maybe they have all the answers, Mm -hmm. but they really don't. Right. And I'm not necessarily looking for answers anyways. So, None of it really this, stuck with me in terms of like being like, oh, yes, I'm going to be Buddhist now because right. of X, Y, and Z. Like right. everyone seemed to have a part of the puzzle, but none mm-hmm. of the, not the whole thing. And this was in high school? This was in high school, yeah. So this was past when you had already said religion isn't yeah. for me. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I've always been interested in exploring it, you know, in terms of, um, you know, I was just reading an article about a, or a little book about a, an artist I really admire who's a Eastern European painter. And he was talking about having this sort of revelation with God. And, and I don't look at it in any kind of judgmental point of view. I look at it from sort of a... Fascinated. Yeah, fascinated. Yeah. Like an anthropological mm-hmm. right. sort of perspective of like, ooh, this is interesting that this right. human here had this experience. I'm more interested in like, how did he have that vision? That's pretty wild. Right, you well, know, it takes over. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's it's something that I've definitely felt, you know, That's anything organized, it, you know, I, I, I've felt distance from since I was a kid. Mm-hmm. I've, I can totally understand that. I mean, it sounds like what you geek out most about is is how the human has kind of interacted in this, let's say, drop them into this scenario and like how do they figure their way through that mm-hmm. it almost seems like you're interested in the viewing of hum- humans which I-, I think for a lot of artists probably a lot that paint humans in general are interested in human beings and kind of how they act and and why they act mm-hmm. and how you justify things and you know and, and i mean I- i'm oddly a big survivor fan which I get a lot of flack for, but it's literally the idea of how humans act in an environment for a million dollars that interests me a lot because it's it's so strategic and so dark sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Well, they bring a natural where they where it sort of differs from maybe life is that there's a inherent competitive element to that right environment. For sure. Whereas there is a competitive element, obviously, with humans in general, but I think it's a little different in terms of yeah, yeah, definitely how you function within it. You know, right. it's not a game mm-hmm. where this is very much you know Survivor. I've never seen Survivor, maybe mm-hmm. snippets here and there, but it's it's set up as a you know as a enclosed game for sure. Um, but, and that is interesting. I mean, that's yeah. I mean, I sort of feel like I'm a visual anthropologist sometimes mm-hmm. in a weird way. Um, because all of this is, you know, looking at culture and why people do the things they do mm-hmm. and, and evolutionary biology mm-hmm. and kind of how that functions into the chemicals that are rushing through our body that make decisions for us and we don't necessarily know why. Mm-hmm. Right. All of that's very fascinating to mm-hmm. me. Um, 
and you know leaning on science for some of it and leaning on mysticism for another mm -hmm. like all of that seems an important part of the conversation mm -hmm. um to carry us forward just like unexplained you know i i listen to some bonkers podcasts that are like really fun and t t tell ghost stories and mm -hmm. and cryptids and all sorts of weird stuff around the world that people say they have interactions with and mm -hmm. um you know, maybe that's some of that weird stuff is just future science, mm. you know, that we haven't figured out. Right. Um, and, 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 you know, the anomalous things that sort of everyone I think experiences in their life that For they're sure. just like, how did that happen? Mm -hmm. What was that? You know, was that chemicals flooding through our brain to give us that vision or was that something breaking our dimension or what was that, you know, right. in terms right. of that to me is very interesting. And, um, I think is all a part of that, like big, big secret I was sort of speaking to. Yeah. Like a uh, flaw in the matrix. Maybe. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously we have Mr. You know, Elon Musk telling us that maybe this is a, right. you know, simulation. a simulation. So it's like, <laughs> we were just but, talking about but that's that. cool that, that someone like that's willing to, to just sort of bring that up since that's probably really prevalent in certain parts of our culture that he's sort of broadened that topic to right. or that possibility to mm -hmm. now is a much more broader topic of conversation. I think that mm -hmm. that's fascinating in yeah. terms of... Then you get rebuttals from very smart people as mm -hmm. well and you go, oh, that's interesting as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's yeah, it's a great um, great way to kind of put an awesome narrative out there as to explaining this world and seeing what other intellectuals have to counter that and see how their mind works as well as like how valid their explanation might seem for what mm -hmm. they're saying. So, I, I mean, I love that kind of stuff in general. Yeah. It's, 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 I don't know. Anthropology was definitely something I was, I had my eye on when I was 19. I decided I wanted to do art and the other thing was anthropology, but I always ask, it's like, okay, does anthropology pay well? They're like, absolutely not. No, <laughs> no. Cool. no I, so I said the same thing when I was young. I, I told my dad, I don't know how old I was, maybe 15 or something. I said, oh, I think I want to be an anthropologist. Mm -hmm. And he's just like, everything's been discovered. And at the time <laughs> I thought, oh, it's a little bit true. And then of course we realized that's so not true. No. Right. And it definitely steered me. I still kept that interest, but it steered me in some different directions and, um, I'm actually quite happy that that I didn't that he said that regardless of like whether he should have or not. Just so it moved me in my own path, mm -hmm. and now right. I'm bringing that those interests that I have back into yeah. my painting and For letting sure. that influence what I what I think and feel and and put on a canvas. Well, yeah. it's just like being an artist. I think that to be an anthropologist you have to have a passion for it the same way that you have to have a passion for art because it's not an easy mm -hmm. route to go i like how so, you you wanted to be be an anthropologist and then they're like they don't pay well and you're like cool i'll, go I'll be an artist art. no because it's i know that art doesn't pay well mm -hmm. but i've got a passion for it mm -hmm. so it's yeah. like i'd rather suffer being an artist than suffer being an anthropologist which is cool but i love art you know so it's right. like yeah. that's the difference where you know there could be somebody that absolutely is obsessed with anthropology mm -hmm. the study of cultures and i can also see somebody just being completely immersed and feel a sense of um i don't know what the word i'm thinking of uh, fulfillment right. just learning about different cultures my my teacher when i was at the junior college, she would spend half of the year teaching anthropology, the other half of the year doing it, and mm -hmm. like in Egypt, like mm -hmm. doing all these like super cool things. And I was like, that's awesome. But did your instructor ever discuss grant funding and funding in general to be able to go do that the other mm -mm, half of the year? No. And see, I think that's a little bit of, you know, when I teach or if someone gets a hold of me and, and you know, I've done sort of strangely enough, I've done quite a lot of interviews with with artists or young aspiring artists out of England and the UK. I don't know mm -hmm. why it seems like my paintings, people find me from the UK quite a bit and get a hold mm -hmm. of me, which is very fascinating and I, I totally That's appreciate it. Yeah. Um, and I'm, you know, I talk to them about the realities of being an artist, you know, and I think maybe if in some of the academic fields, if, if they discuss some of those realities and maybe they do now, and I'm just so old that mm -hmm. like they, I, I'm not aware of it, but in terms of 
you know, if that was discussed about how much an archaeologist has to grind to get funding and mm-hmm. how right. little it probably is and how they have to dip into their own pocket at times, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, you have to be really dedicated. Right. Um, and I think with the advent of the internet and just information being accessible, you can find out some of this stuff so much more than, than when I was a kid. So I didn't grow up with, you know, the internet. I've sort of had it for, didn't have it for half my life and then had it for about half my life. So right. I have a very different relationship to it than, um, than anyone growing now who's maybe under 30, I don't know, under 25. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So yeah. I had to go look at microfiche to find information. Do you guys remember what microfiche is? I don't no, know like what is that? Microfiche would be like, um, little slides of newspapers uh-huh. that you would then roll into a, a display box and it was sort of like a big bulky display box and then it would magnify it and put it on the screen and then you would roll on the side you would roll right. these to, to like move the microfiche through the illumination part that that like magnifies the, it to your to the screen size right and that's how you would look up old articles and get information on certain topics it was, it was like in the horror movies yeah, have you seen all that the, like no but yeah. bone collector was like an <laughs> angelina jolie movie they did that in i think yeah so that that's you know having to do that or or just you know, and uh, Encyclopedia Britannica as being in terms of volumes of things. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Encyclopedia Britannica, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> where it's just like a volume of like a wide range of information. Even that mm-hmm. was sort of rare yeah. when I was a kid to have access to something like mm-hmm. that. You know, yeah. um, where you I, could look through a lot of information quickly. I'm 33, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> but um, I feel like I've. I'm like the, the, the like my I'm like my my younger brother and sister they kind of seem to be way more internet savvy and mm-hmm. computer savvy than I am and I I always think that I like you said 30 I think that's roughly around like the cutoff time of right when internet was a standard in school and kind of like mm-hmm. the you mm-hmm. grow up using it uh, Yeah, I didn't have it in high school. So yeah. I mean I'm I'm you know nearly 10 years older than you. So yeah. I I didn't have access to that till i was in my 20s you know yeah. mm-hmm. so it's very different yeah, um, yeah that's but it, and everything you know and i think there's sort of a pushback against technology and For social sure. media and all these things as well we're sort of experiencing now a little bit which i think is is ultimately a good thing you know yeah, yeah. um it does have so many pros but yeah certainly there are some cons yeah as with every technology yeah definitely you had mentioned that you do a lot of research mm-hmm. for in other cultures, which is super interesting. Our friend um, John Wentz moved to Paris mm-hmm. recently, and he was a teacher at the academy. And one of the things he said that was really interesting to us is that, you know, being American uh, and having this, like, emphasis on work culture, mm-hmm. um, artists are obsessed with being full-time, right? Like, that's kind of like another sign that you've made it or successful mm-hmm. is that you're doing, you're making your money off of being a full-time artist um he said in france that nobody like cares about it like no one cares like they're just worried about the how good your artwork is they're also very into uh your social media so if you have like a high following that's like oh you've made it you're Mm -hmm. you know but here it's more like are you making a full-time living off of your art that's like your sign of success i'm curious Mm -hmm. if what has stood out to you researching other countries and researching like asian i think you said you were researching Mm -hmm. like asian art culture and stuff like that yeah i guess a little backstory there would be you know quite a few of my instructors were chinese at the academy Mm -hmm. of art and that they may you know, there was a handful of them. I don't know if they're still there. Um, I guess it'd be a few of them are. And if you look at, um, I think what got me started in terms of looking abroad more and not just looking to like American artists, um, was those instructors. And they, you know, they were schooled tremendously well in terms of in an academic approach and then sort of would do whatever it is they would do with their skills at that point. Um, and if you research that, you find out that all of them, because of political reasons and so social political reasons, they went and studied in Russia. Wow. Right. So Russia and the Ilya Repin Academy is actually that approach to art and that sort of academy structure and, and sort of, you know, 
I took three cla- three classes on just studying heads and hands. <laughs> I mean, that's a deep dive into right. anatomy and physiology and a lot of looking and mm-hmm. and. I mean, even maybe too much, maybe mm-hmm. too almost like scientific, you know. Right. But that's where the Chinese. That's where I found out more. Of my Chinese instructors got that, and then you, you look at how art was used in Russia, um, right. and it was a it was a lot to present very admirable views of sort of real life there, even though maybe the societally it, it wasn't necessarily the case, you know, like mm-hmm. Mao, and then Mao used those same approaches right. during like the Chinese revolution in terms of him, him looking, you know, like a seven foot tall stud in a field around a community of people. Right. Um, it's, it's a somewhat like a propaganda tool. Certain, I'm sorry. That's exactly what I was thinking of a sort of yeah. propaganda and just sort of like you can, influencing. Yeah society's like vision of what they're doing and and you see it a lot with military movies now Mm -hmm. you know like america's not hitting you over the head being like uh you know the army's great but you watch a military movie and all of a sudden it's 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 a praising of the military which i mean you could have either opinion or whatever you want on that but there is an influence and it's based around the idea that to use that military equipment which is owned by the government you they have to look through your script and kind of approve it so Mm -hmm. there is this if you wanted to be anti-government or anti-military they would be like ah well you can't make that movie with our tanks and jets and whatever so yeah there's a there's a control a little bit of control element that's interesting i didn't know that yeah um so looking i think also just looking at um sort of back to sort of looking at Russia and China. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the Chinese, once they once the revolution ended and these artists were able to see what was happening around the world, like, you know, they hadn't seen a Matisse t- or a Picasso or a Caravaggio right. until like the 70s and 80s. Wow. And to them, that was mind-blowing to see the whole like modernist movement that was happening, all the isms that happened mm-hmm. through the 1900s. Right. You know, they were, they were, they didn't see that develop. Um, and so kind of what's happening there, I think some of the most exciting art, especially painters, because there is something in their culture back from those foundations of the Russian Academy that there's just a lot of really great painters in, in China specifically sure. who, um, yeah, I just, I really enjoy their stuff, mm-hmm. you know, um, yeah. and, and they're getting, and why I think it's sort of in all the blue, you know, the ones who are in all the blue chip galleries is because there's also sort of a societal paradigm to their painting in terms of, you know, making criticisms of their government, et cetera. So, right. um, I mean, I think you're, you were asking about, you know, what I've discovered for me, I, I, I really I couldn't sort of summarize it up just because I'm often looking at individual artists Mm -hmm. and then you eventually feel or you eventually discover maybe one artist worked with another or they went to art school together and then you go, oh, okay, so you can think of these two kind of as, you know, as sort of compatriots growing up, learning to paint, et cetera. Um, So you're looking more at them for inspiration or just curiosity? I'm always looking at... Like how they're thinking and why. Mm -hmm. So, for example, like I tell my students this all the time is like, if you're going to like, don't, don't get caught in back to that dirty word again of style. Mm -hmm. Don't get caught in looking at someone's style because there is a sort of a splash or an effect that a final painting can have Mm -hmm. or a final illustration or whatever it is that you're interested can have sort of a punch and like a, uh, you know, a dazzling quality. Mm -hmm. And that's fantastic. Like we're there to have sort of a, we're there because we love visual, visual culture. That's why we're looking at it. Mm -hmm. But in terms of think of why they're making those choices, I always just recommend to go looking at like their sketchbook Mm -hmm. or going to look at their process of like, you know, an artist I really admire. He does tons of writing and Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not that way, but I certainly do some writing. Right. Um, and that's where he's generating his work from. Right, it's that's from his more, research, that's his from planning. More from literature mm-hmm. versus looking out into like mm-hmm. the visual culture of what's going on. He's mm-hmm. looking at 
authors, poets, philosophers, right. etc. Right. Um, and I know other people who are sort of more half and half, and, and I don't know where I fall, but I certainly, um, you know, I'm kind of in that mix, too, of, of mm -hmm. relying on reading mm -hmm. about subject matter that I like that sort of sparks imagery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not ever a literal translation like an illustration would be. It's sort of a more... Um, a narrative that's co connected, but it's not literal or direct to what right. I'm, I'm reading. I think I understand that. Uh, it's this interpretation. Is it? Is it? You're trying to capture like uh, overall like feel or something of? It's just how my messy brain works in terms yeah. of maybe there's you know maybe I'm really reading a lot about. Um, South America and like mm -hmm. colonialism there, archaeology there, that environment. And then maybe I'll look at my reference that I've sort of this folders that I look through um, and I'll be thinking about like embodied cognition, which is this religions use this, myths use this, where it seems like it's a, a normal everyday story, but then mm -hmm. there's one thing that's inserted in the story that makes it fantastical. And then because there's that disruption, it sticks in our brains longer than a regular story would. I mean, why do you think Grimm's fairy tales have right. sort of lasted so long and we've seen so many iterations is because mm -hmm. those are just like kids going through the woods, but what happens? They, they encounter a witch or sort of a, a creature or monster mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. that fantastical element that mm -hmm. spins reality on its head. Mm -hmm. right. And then that stays with you longer, mm -hmm. you know? I, I mean, kind of religions used it in a way I think that's um, to their own intents, you know, mm -hmm. whereas like myths have used it a little differently. Mm -hmm. um, and so my, I think some of my painting is, is derived from that as well in terms right. of I'll be thinking about a variety of topics and then something will just spark and I'll mm -hmm. do a quick little thumbnail mm -hmm. um, and move the painting it's forward it's from like there. You're creating your own folklore ba based off of what you're researching and reading about. Yeah. Yeah. I, th you know, that's, that's something I've been thinking about just in the last month or so mm. as I've looked through my work and I've been looking over the last couple of years of work and thinking, oh, I'm kind of making a world where all these people exist in, mm -hmm. and, but it's their own thing. Right. Um, and so that's been very interesting to think about it that way in terms of inventing, like, what does that landscape look like if I'm doing something that's more devoid of figures or figures are secondary and then mm -hmm. what do you know what do the the people look like and how do they function in this sort of alternate space alternate sort of world um so i've been thinking about that more and more that's very cool mm -hmm. that's cool it reminds me i mean the first thing that when you brought kind of the the ability to add fantasy to a story to make you remember i don't is the first thing i thought about was noah's ark you know, the story of a guy putting all the animals on a boat. And one of the cool tricks, I don't know if you want to call it a trick or not, but let's call it tools they use to uh, kind of sell the story is the idea of the rainbow. So the idea in the story is that the rainbow exists because it's God's promise that he'll never flood the entire earth again. Mm -hmm. And there's something interesting about how I can look at that rainbow that shows up as a kid or whatever and go like, that's that it, like it, 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 um, it almost proves the story in a, in a, in a bad, you know what I mean, like not mm -hmm. necessarily bad, but like in a, in a reverse engineered type of way of like, Oh, that's proof that God exists and that that story is real. So it's, it's one of those, I mean, I'm not trying to like talk smack about it or anything, but it can, that's what it, it kind of reminds me with how you're using what seems to be historical stories or fact and, and mixing in, um, fantasy, it, it, even the, I don't know. I wouldn't even say fantasy. I would say personal mythology. Sure. Yeah, right? Yeah. Because everyone sort of lives under their own sort of 
things that are factual and things that right. are not factual. And we sort of formulate identity through that, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, we're always kind of this blend of, of myth and right. real world anyways. For sure. You know, I think that there's some good research on this that shows I think that 90% of what we know we get mm-hmm. through an indirect source, basically through someone else right. or through obviously many, many other people and, and mm-hmm. outlets. So indirect mean I didn't read it, right. I didn't observe it, you know. Hmm. So that's 90% of like maybe who we are. I think there's an, that's another level of where... I think my painting sort of function too, because it's kind of asking like, you know, you're presented with a painting, an image on the wall, and then how do you relate to it and why? Right. Yeah. And and that's to me very interesting because I, I've plenty of times put a painting up and someone will come up and like, they'll feel it's dark or a little sinister right. as you were sort of mentioning earlier, MJ. And then someone else will be like, oh, it seems so hopeful, you right. know, and, and, yeah how is that happening yeah. on this same image? To me, that's really fascinating. Yeah. Um, but it's funny because looking at your work before we had the podcast, uh, not today, but like when I, when Sergio first kind mm-hmm. of uh, put me on to your work, I, I looked at it and I seem to be getting this interpretation more and more throughout looking at people's work, which is I think so many artists are doing this dark humor Hmm. Like I, for some reason I'm like, Oh, there, there's like this dark comedy to it. And I've asked artists if that's, if their art's trying to capture this like dark humor and almost all of them are like, no, not at all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, it's me. <laughs> I'm the, the guy into dark comedies. Yeah. Right. That's the lens you're putting on top of it is you yeah. view, view the work. I mean, and also too, I mean, that's, that's not unexpected. I don't think because we aren't, tragedy and comedy like the two two sides of the same coin in a way yeah, you yeah. know i mean i think that that's there's a lot of truth to that in terms of looking at I don't know, shakespeare and, sure. and even something more like um who's the director of of us or of um oh, jordan uh, peele jordan peele you uh, know yeah. he started his comedy and now he's doing these right dark horror dark horror you know more drama based kind of even his last one seemed like a dark comedy to me the get out us yes Yes. i was like oh this is a comedy yeah but that they're close right and that and then listening to other podcasts too about comedians talking about how you know they'll they'll reference that as well Mm -hmm. so i mean that that to me is an area that i i feel like i should look into more just to kind of understand how they're interlaced or not Mm -hmm. Um, I, i always find that it depends for, at least for me, for the the reason I say like the movie Us is a comedy is, and a lot of things I think fall under this category is how it ends. Mm. Is are you so, gonna give a spoiler here? Oh, have you not seen it? <laughs> no, I've not seen it. <laughs> okay. But I don't really care. You know what I mean? Like mm. I was saying it for anyone anything, who's but... listening to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for uh, spoiler catch it. spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a Incoming. moment at the end. I won't I won't spoil it. But there is a moment at the end that seems to be the joke of the movie. Mm-hmm. It seems to be like. Oh, this was like, uh, it's like the punchline or the payoff. Yeah, or and it seems yeah. like jokes or comedies. If if you put the whole thing into a narrative, it goes like, oh, this was building up to this this moment here, which is a joke. Well, and even some comedies, if you really look at it, it's like a, a ton of jokes in it. But then the ending, you're like, oh, well, that was a tragedy because right. it ended horribly. Mm-hmm. The well, story it, in general. It's also like comics, like are some of the most depressed people. For sure. Like mm-hmm. the best comedians always talk about other comedians and it's like, yeah, you have to go through like tragedy and be able to laugh at it because that's how other people relate. Mm-hmm. Well, so struggle you, in general, I think is just important in art. I mean, me and Serge have had this conversation where he doesn't think that. And I still am tinkering around with the idea of struggle. I think you need to parse that a little bit more in that yeah. conversation in terms yeah. of someone having a tough life growing right. up and, and, you know, plenty of good comedy has come from that and plenty mm-hmm. of good art has come from that. But there's also plenty of very well-known successful people too in, in, in those worlds that yeah. have had a pretty average Right, no, yeah, Ra- yeah. you know, fairly loving family mm-hmm. or loving family, and they're raised. And I, I think that some of what you're getting at is very interesting, and in that there is a bit of a myth of like the struggling poor, right. 
um, starving artist, starving artist. But right. you know, in terms of that whole thing that that I felt as a high schooler, mm-hmm. that that I didn't have a lot of people around me who right, could right. be seen as a like a template or a mentor or someone who could say, oh, this is what the art world's like. I mean, mm-hmm. they kind of lived under that same illusion of like everyone's poor and starving and, and right. troubled and that's why they're going to their creativity and, and yeah. not to say that certainly I think that's of, a flawed idea for sure. Yeah. But I, I think, so the idea of struggle I think is important for creating art. I don't necessarily mean that that means you had to struggle. It's almost like there has to be it's almost like it seems like so for instance we as human beings have this ability to feel empathy and artists seem to have an abundance of empathy i think empathy allows you to understand struggle even if it's not as simple as like um poor person or or you know uh, genocide in Uganda or some shit like that. Yeah, it doesn't need to be grand. It can no. be. It can be the simple things. Yeah, it can or be the, the smaller sh- things in exactly. life. Exactly. Yeah. The struggle of a plant without sun can easily be a struggle. You know, mm-hmm. it's like it's 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 literally anything. You have the and an artist ha- can have the ability to see that and and take advantage of it. That sounds mean or whatever but but you have the ability Mm -hmm. to kind of make their own interpretation yeah to find struggle in a lot of things yeah i i mean i agree with you if someone's like tearing up in a movie it's like i i'm like i'm very uh, you know emotional person and i and i don't necessarily show it on the surface but i certainly feel that way yeah um and i'll start tear you know kind of tearing up a little bit just because i'm seeing a a visual of a person having that happen to them Mm -hmm. and so i definitely think in terms of the spectrum of empathy. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of artists are certainly, I don't know if you want to see a little more raw to the world, but certainly have more, certainly seem to have a little bit more connectedness to some of those emotions right? versus maybe some other people who are just born that way in terms of to be more analytical mm-hmm. or be more logical brain thinking. You mm-hmm. know, we need those people too. Right. Um, we also need, the artist as well you know so it's like everyone living within that spectrum of you know we need all of it really Mm -hmm. um to get it sort of the entirety of our existence you know because i i my brother's very very smart and like logical thinking and how he wraps around his brain around certain things is always like oh i never as an artist like i never would have thought of that right um but it is that thing i think for art like for instance, a painter has the ability to make you care about something that seems non-important in your day-to-day routine. You know, you can, uh, it's like, um, I think it's Homer who paints like, he'll paint like a haunting tree, you know, and it's like, I might walk past that tree every day, but he, he can paint it in a way that makes you actually care about it. Mm-hmm. And that ability, I think, comes from empathy. The, the And then alter like making caring about it's like the idea of how i said earlier if like there's a plant who's slowly dying because it just happens to be in the shade because of whatever reason it's like you can easily empathize with a plant dying based off of the fact that they're in shade mm-hmm. where i don't know if that's necessary i don't i can't put myself in the brain that can't do that I wonder if there are, this is me and my true, because I'm obsessed with true crime. Mm -hmm. I've been watching this show called Mindhunter where they're trying to figure out like serial killers. And so, you know, one of the common things again about serial killers, CEOs, is that they're psychopaths. They have no ability to feel empathy. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, is there artists out there that are psychopaths slash don't have empathy and what their art would look like if it would just be representational where it's just like, I'm just going to paint that image. I mean, I Mm, I because then they may, I wonder if they're able to be creative and like, well, there was that clown that was a serial killer who painted. He, I heard that he didn't paint though. That he oh, like yeah, that's would. True. Yeah, that I just heard that. Yeah, yeah. He, what if you know? I something that I've really been sort of tangentially related to this is just that I sort of feel painters fall in their own category within the art world, mm-hmm. and whereas you can be um, many other different sort of disciplines of art and have a different sort of mindset 
for okay. sort of, you know, maybe if you're doing something where you're printing out everything on a computer and a printer, you're not going to have as much empathy because y- you wouldn't be using that computer if you did, you know? Right. And I, I mean, I, it, it, it's a very sort of rudimentary thought in terms of to understand what the, the motivations of someone. Um, but I certainly think there are people, yes, in that whole entire spectrum, but that are doing something creative. I think for me, it's, it's breaking off painting from sort of living in the rest of the art world. I think it has its own place and Mm -hmm. I think it has something that's, and I'm not speaking to this as well as I would like to right now, but in terms of, um, I mean, I think it makes sense. The mindset is a little different than if you were to do other types of art and also the dedication is a little different to be able to, to move your hand and train your eye and to understand a certain level of, even if, you know, whether you're doing representational painting or, or, you know, abstractions kind of a a broad messy term, but in terms of if you're doing something that's just shape based or form based or what have you, Mm -hmm. um, you still need to know a certain level of things, a certain level of skills to be able to, to function. Whereas, you don't necessarily need that in, in other disciplines that are in the art world. You For know? sure. Um, I think. Well, it's like Adolf Hitler. He was a very, like a pretty good <laughs> painter. Yeah. Who's, who's like, this guy? What did I say? <laughs> yeah, you said, you said, yeah. Is that his name? I don't yeah. know. I've never heard of him. No, you're making me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but like he was Give me like, his background he was story. like a very good, mm-hmm. like representational painter, you mm-hmm. know, but it's like. And that wasn't popular at the time. Is that why he got shut down? I don't know. He just wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't as good, I think. I think he technically wasn't like the. But like, he wasn't bad. Yeah. No, well, yeah. But he, in that time, I think representational was so like, it was such a big, it was like, especially in that, that kind of area of the world, it's like, you're competing with the best of the best. Right. Well, there's you just a lot of other really movements good. happening away yeah. from. The, right. The, I don't. The May for, away from realism in the first place, you know, through mm-hmm. all the different art schools in that time period, there's a lot of other avenues being explored and, and you know, back to all the isms. So yeah, he just didn't fall into Probably. his, you know, into the right space. I mean, mm-hmm. I, it, that goes back to why do people quit and why others stay with it? I mean, you have some roadblocks or some things that don't quite work out and you've just got right. to regroup and, and ask yourself, okay, do I really want this? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and either the, carry forward or don't, you right. know? It's the, um, the grit. I think yeah. that's, that's like the... Like, that's one of the most fundamental things to being a successful artist, I think. And I think it's also yeah. life circumstance. Like some people, maybe Absolutely. somebody got yeah. their girl pregnant and mm-hmm. had to be like, I can't try and pursue this anymore. Now I need to work. Yeah, certainly. But I think all of that falls under this idea of like, you kind of have to have this uh, overwhelming like thing pushing you forward. It's like, it's like a, I don't know if anything could stop me from pursuing art other than death and maybe losing my arms and legs. And <laughs> what if? Your yeah, arms like and legs. Something extreme. Mm-hmm. And you might not even stop then. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, look at... Um, I mean, there are writers who have been sort of paralyzed and other people, yeah. and, and they find a way to mm-hmm. keep, to keep For moving sure. forward. I think financial burden is probably one of the most overwhelming reasons why artists quit. Mm-hmm. And, Certainly. Uh, if you didn't know that going in, let us let you know that now. <laughs> it's not easy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, student debt and, and where are you living? And mm-hmm. I mean, I moved even in 2000, late 2002, early 2003, I moved from San Francisco to Portland. Nice. One, I just didn't really have a lot of love for the Bay Area in terms of wanting to stay there and kind of establish roots. And a lot Mm -hmm. of my other, my close friends were sort of moving off in different directions, doing their thing as well. And so it felt like, you know, things were breaking up anyways. And and every avenue that was commercial was shut down to me more or less in terms of that portfolio, that work didn't get traction, but my painting did. So then I kept, those are the doors. I mean, the reason why I'm a painter today is that those are the doors that kept opening Mm -hmm. and I was just sort of naive enough to walk through them and go, oh, okay, you know, and not, and, and then exceedingly not 
thinking about any commercial work or not developing those skills all just kind of naturally fell off because Mm -hmm. this other avenue was opening. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, yeah, I moved to to Portland to make it easier on myself, Mm -hmm. you know. I mean, even after, you know, maybe a year and a half or so, maybe two tops, like I could already get a studio space in Portland and have like an apartment. Mm -hmm. You couldn't do that now. Like I know, I mean, it's certainly cheaper than California and LA and San Francisco, you know, but you know, you couldn't come up here and and try to really just kind of get by with very minimal Mm -hmm. anymore and certainly not have an apartment and a studio space to kind of do. So even the landscape here certainly has changed quite a bit since, since I've been up here. Yeah. So since you, after you graduated, what was your trajectory? You said you had tried to get into like the movie side of things, but that didn't really work out for you. So did you get work in commercial type stuff? Um, yeah, no, I, I've dabbled with some commercial work, Mm -hmm. but it just never stuck. And I was always painting Mm -hmm. because those are the, like I was saying, like, it just felt like, oh, I would get in a little group show here in some small town in Oregon. And that was like my first, that was my first entry into like, okay, great. I sent a show here and, and sort of found my own opportunity and then capitalized on it and sort of moved forward beyond the walls of the art school that I went to, you mm-hmm. know, it was like completely yeah. disassociated from that world. And that felt good. <laughs> um, and so I just, you know, I had a really great friend. I have a couple of really good friends in town who, you know, one, one of them owns like a G clay printing company mm-hmm. and the other one owns a framing store. And at the time they were in the same building and I worked there kind of full time for six or eight months when I moved up here and then kind of nice. progressively drop days and try to get more wiggle room to paint. Mm-hmm. Um, and then ended up working within this sort of framing G clay printing publishing sort of company probably for five years or so. And, a, and a, quite a few of those last years, I was just like the Saturday guy. You know, I worked slowly chipped away at the full time until I could just have one or two days working and mm-hmm. then the other four to five open. Right. Um, and so that was my strategy when I, you know, and I think that at the time too here in in Portland, I do to say illustration, at least w- what I was looking for, there weren't a lot of outlets for it in terms of maybe more narrative illustration or something that's that's book oriented or publishing or you know game design even then wasn't as nearly as advanced as it was now mm-hmm. um and that really wasn't an opportunity here if you were going to mm-hmm. do something that was a little more commercial oriented it would be i think more in the design world like portland's a very strong design community you know product design clothing design and mm-hmm. we've got nike and adidas headquartered here and i right. think i think under armor just might have moved here in the last couple of years and mm-hmm. to have like a, a big outlet so most of the people that i knew in town who were like quote unquote creatives or they were working in some way kind of in those more graphic design mm-hmm. product design worlds right. less less than like straight straight ahead illustration Mm -hmm. um so i just didn't even really try to to me that was like i would have to pause everything and and run down that path for a long time to Mm -hmm. make that happen because you need the same as you were saying you need the same grit and sort of dedication as we've sort of been talking about Mm -hmm. just to go be maybe an independent graphic designer you know and you have to network and find where your Your work functions and all that kind of stuff so um so you fell into gallery work pretty quickly? Right away. Nice. Yeah, right away. And and just figured out, you know, as I got in, I just, like you were saying, in terms of early, very beginning of our conversation of just like, you just have, there's no path. You just have to find what mm-hmm. works. Right. You know, I had to figure out, oh, how do I do, I've got to do this thing for my taxes. What What's that about? Mm-hmm. You know, I have to do you know, marketing, I have to find the resources that provide opportunity. And and again, the internet wasn't organizations, resources for artists, that information wasn't necessarily always on the internet, even though they were a well-known institution or a place that gave grants or gave residencies or whatever. It's like Mm -hmm. you still really had to dig for quite a lot of that stuff. Right. Um, so it's just like was piecemealing it together, figuring it out. And I knew that 
also too that most likely I wasn't after a couple of years up here I realized pretty quickly that I wasn't going to be able to make do what I want to do I think just creatively and then thus in turn sort of make a living whatever that meant mm -hmm. um, just by staying in Portland mm -hmm. I sort of figured that out within a few years mm -hmm. um, and then I looked to Seattle and worked a little bit up there as well in the first few years outside of school and realized too that like for just whatever reason Seattle has tons of tech companies seems to be kind of a creative ver or like a bigger version of Portland and like a lot of creatives and a lot of music obviously um, but just the support for painting and some of the arts up there just didn't seem as strong as it could have been mm -hmm. I think now we're seeing there's the Seattle Art Fair, which has been around now for four or five years, I think, or so. And so mm -hmm. maybe we're seeing more traction up there. Um, so then once I looked there and realized, you know, I didn't have any pathway in, I started looking to the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And so that's really, you know, working from a distance has been my sort of MO for the last, you know, 10, 12 years where I do everything here and I ship it. Um, and you know, and yeah. at that point, it's just a matter of finding galleries that work well with mm -hmm. you. Absolutely. Yeah. I've had plenty of galleries that the relationship just wasn't right. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, it, and, and, or, or I knew maybe looking down the road, like five years down the road, how could it be functioning? And those people were, everyone I've worked with was terrific and was where I needed to be in those moments. Um, but I just kept thinking about like, okay, here I am and I want to work in this world, going back to that idea of just sort of thinking about where you want to be ultimately and kind of gearing yourself towards that. Yeah. And I realized, okay, well, that's not it. So I need to find the next thing to, mm -hmm. to still be responsible to the relationships I had, but always looking further afield till I found the right right spaces for sure um and then once you do that long enough you know that's why i love character actors because they just seem to be around long enough and then they get awards you know whereas like you know the, the supporting actor or the main actor whatever they get you know they get that stuff con they get the praise constantly whereas like there's some great character actors who just right. like yeah that guy's been in 75 movies i've seen him in he deserves some recognition you know so it's yeah. like if you just stick around long enough I feel like people will come across your work, especially now with the internet. So once I was moving and, and sort of working with some galleries on the East Coast for a while, it's like other places just found me mm -hmm. and would get a hold of me. And so I had to do less of the legwork of right. either promotion or either just identifying what's the, you know, what kind of art is being shown and, and where and why and like, you know, how to move in that circle right you yeah. know and i think from a distance i realized it's really really tough to move into certain circles from a distance right. and i and i don't necessarily know how to square that i mean yeah. i i've i think about that quite a bit you know i think yeah. it has to be some dumb luck mm -hmm. you know it has to be like you know the number one thing you can do is probably get a recommendation from another artist mm -hmm. for I mean, sure. probably the number one thing you can do or some collector who mm -hmm. is a patron of the gallery mm -hmm. you know if you're working from a distance so for sure um i don't know that that's kind of has been my approach you know Send a fruit up basket. to this point <laughs> if yeah if, <laughs> if it were that easy <laughs> do you yeah. still feel uh just as strongly about gallery work even i don't know you know we've i've been working with galleries for probably 10 years mm -hmm. and it's just like i can't wrap my head around making enough money through working with galleries because mm -hmm. they take half of it mm -hmm. you know you sell a painting for two grand you get half of that that's like you know that was the whole mentality as to like you know we're trying to explore mural work and stuff like that because it's i can't wrap my head around mm -hmm. and put out enough work to make enough money to live off of mm -hmm. with galleries it's yeah um i'm always looking like I just want to do interesting things mm -hmm. and I understand like gallery, the galleries I work with allow me to do some of that in terms of, you know, I, I can paint what I want to paint mm -hmm. and they're happy to bring it in mm -hmm. or tell me, Hey, 
maybe not those two, but we'll take these other ones, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Like whatever it happens mm -hmm. to be for the most part, there's no directive from the galleries that I work with in terms of your work needs to look this way or be this way, or you did this really great piece and you know, something along those lines, that scenario, you know, maybe when I was younger, I listened to that a little bit more, but certainly, you know, in the last 10 or 12 years, it's very much like if a gallery, a gallerist or a dealer would sort of say that, um, I would know it's not for me. So, um, but back to your question, I, of course, I, I'm, you know, I rely on the galleries to do a good job for me. Um, and likewise, I try to do a good job for them. And I'm always trying to make direct connections. I think one of like the, kind of one of the tragedies of this whole like business model of painting in a way is that I, I enjoy hearing people who don't know I'm the artist talk about the work, you know, maybe during an opening or, you know, I will just like eavesdrop on people's conversations and mm -hmm. they don't necessarily know I've done the painting um, just to hear what kind of feedback. And I find it just wonderful when you have some people who are very much just like no holds barred will give you the feedback. You know, I have a, a collector who's so fantastic at long emails saying why this was working, why it wasn't, or mm -hmm. just referencing a couple of paintings um, and giving his opinion and knowing like, that's great. Like my skin's not thin enough to where if you say something that's negative or, or what have you, that, that that's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that hearing that oftentimes, and I don't know if this is your guys' experience, but oftentimes we do get a lot of just general praise, you For know, sure. and, and that's fantastic. But I think some of the tragedy of like the gallery setup is that I wish there was a little more feedback mm -hmm. on works to know what people are pulling away from it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if I had my own gallery space and could be in there talking with people like that would be, I think very insightful. Then again, on the flip side of that, that's a lot of energy right. and I would rather be putting that into painting. So it's always yeah. this like give and take of, you know, how things are, how you want them to be and like where do you settle yeah. between wanting feedback and needing it at times and also like you're going to paint what you're going to paint anyway. So whatever they're saying I, isn't, I, isn't sort of affecting things either way. I think there's a huge benefit to like the – the pushback is kind of what I keep calling it, but it's this idea of not necessarily, uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's not talking shit or even critiquing. It's the idea of being able to have an idea and have someone push back against that idea to kind of see if it's worth its weight to see like, Oh, I have this idea for this work or uh, this is what I'm trying to do. And, and I think in a way, I think a lot of time, I think, where I find that to be, I think the more and more I think about, it, the more I think artist, the art com artist community is kind of responsible of, of of that job. At least to me, of pushing back against an artist idea because I think that's who we respect the most as far as opinions. I'm not trying to talk any smack ag ag with galleries because I also respect their opinions also collectors and any art enthusiasts really. Um, but I think where I find the most validation or the most, which will the most that will kind of put me in, let me step back and kind of rethink maybe I am wrong about this, or maybe there is a, a waste of importance to this idea, you know, um, to help course correct you yeah if you feel like, like uh yeah an idea is not as you, you know we're all all artists are a little bit delusional right i mean yeah. to a certain degree we kind of have to we have to live in in sort mm -hmm. of that space to be a little delusional to think that like we can just paint things and people right. find interest in them um but yeah you're putting something out into the public yeah. so the public has every right to say whatever they're yeah. going to say but it, it's, it's even like for instance if you hear about people like there's a there's a uh, I forget the lady's name, but she's from, she, she grew up in the Westboro Baptist church. Her dad was, or her grandpa was the main guy. And she's been, she's changed her way or like her thinking. And she's like a really smart person and a really kind person. 
But when you hear about the, the ways people would push back against her ideas, it was never malicious or anything like that. But whenever someone made a very valid point about her ideas of how she put how, what made sense to her in her world, because you can justify this is why I do this, you know, like these are why I do these things. And sometimes someone can point out a simple flaw in that and that um, thinking and finds a way through. It's yeah. Fine. It finds and you go like, through. oh, yeah. You're talking about the the family member who like broke away right yeah, from yeah, everything yeah, yeah so yeah. yeah something clearly found a way through yeah you know which is which is good i mean i yeah. I yeah some of my and i don't know what your two experiences some of the paintings that i absolutely think there's something unquestionable to it mm -hmm. and i can't necessarily put my finger on it as to why have gone out into the world been in multiple shows been hanging around in and out of the studio and you're just like wait a second yeah. you know and then you do something that you value and you've put your time and effort into but you don't necessarily feel it's strong and it's either bought by a collector or given some sort of praise and you're just like yeah w i don't see that necessarily and you know that's another thing sometimes just, you can even see it you can almost be like people are gonna like this i don't you know what i mean i i haven't got there oh really oh my goodness yeah like i I'm often the flip. Mm -hmm. I put something other thing, and this this could be very interesting, and then mm -hmm. it's just like crickets, yeah. you know. I and mean, I, I no, I I agree with that point. Like, I agree that my favorite paintings a lot of times are that. Like, let me see if it works in this gallery. Mm -hmm. Let me see if it works in that gallery. Like, but um, but at the same time, there is this. T there are sometimes where I'm like, well, this looks commercially good. Like, this looks mm -hmm. like something people will ingest very easily and kind of just be like, I like it. It looks cool. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, they're going to like this one. I don't like it. Cause it didn't, it doesn't interest me. I just kind of either, maybe it's, I have a deadline and I'm just knocking something out. That's not really that I didn't get to chew on long enough or something like that. But sometimes I can kind of see and go like, uh, people are going to like this and I don't at all. Mm -hmm. I don't know. No, I, I, yeah, I think, that just goes back to the fickle nature of, of arts in general yeah. in terms of how you can show something to someone one day and, and the same thing to them the next day and right. get two different responses, yeah. you know? Or it's even like the, back to comedians, it's a concept of hack, you know? It's like, it's like they know it's going to work, but to a comedian, they're like, yeah, It's maybe not know. pushing new ground or yeah. new territory, which is kind of sounds like, I mean, I think there's always the idea of pushing you know, you're, you're trying, you know, as an artist, you're trying to learn, you're trying mm -hmm. to expand what you know. Um, but there is a, there is a place for pop music. Sure. Know? Yeah, of course. There I mean, is a place for, um, make dolls. I don't, this sounds like I'm talking shit, but, uh, but you know what I mean? Like there is a place for easy, digestible artwork and it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just sometimes artists, us being people who get bored licking the envelope again, you know, it's like we want to really push boundaries and move forward and constantly be learning. And this has been done too many times. I don't want to like either I do my take on it and I do it in a way that I find creative, which is great. But then it's also like if I just unintentionally did something that's been done over and over and over again, I realize that I'm like, ah, I hate it. You know, it's, it's, it's a weird. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's, you know, something like that, that has a shorter shelf life, mm -hmm. um, you know, after a while, I mean, explore, I anyone should feel comfortable exploring mm -hmm. whatever that was. But then after a while, if, if you're getting that kind of internal reaction, then you've got to ask yourself some more serious questions, right, you know, sure. and just versus, um, being happy to stay in that lane. That's what, you know, I mean, it, it I look at so many different types of artists and, and I've seen some of them change like artists I really, really like. And then, you know, 10 or 12 years down the road, they change and I'm trying to follow along, but I'm mm -hmm. just like, Hmm, I don't get it. But I'm happy that, that they moved right. in that direction just for the general idea of, I don't know where I'm going to be in 10 years. Yeah. So that's, you know, it's like, it's nice to see that, that you just have to follow your own muse and keep asking it questions and feeding it. And for sure. Um, being open to what it could bring. I, I always tell art collectors, not necessarily pertaining to me, but sometimes they'll say like, oh, I really liked when they were doing this style. And I'm always like, 
when they're when that's happening, you should buy that art because artists are always changing and you mm-hmm. might not like them five years from now because of what they're doing. But if that's what you liked, you're going to regret not buying that because they're going to change it up. Hopefully. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, that's good. That's good advice to tell yeah. someone who's less creatively inclined or just feels very outside the art, you know, kind of an art creative world, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. They definitely have, it's not, um, it's not a product that's going to like stay around necessarily if you want to think of it in that sort of a simplistic term. For like, sure. It'll be, it's, it'll be adjusted. And it's only based on my feelings of like, cause I wish I had a, a bajillion dollars to buy artwork cause I'm a big fan of it as well. But it's, it's the idea of like, I see artists change and I'm like, oh, I wish I was able to buy their work when they were doing that stuff because mm-hmm. that's not going to happen ever again. That's that moment. And where they are now is a different human being pursuing something different. That's not necessarily clicking with me, but like, yeah, it's the whole, like I support that, but Mm -hmm. I wish I had that little stamp in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, I kick myself occasionally for not, not buying a Kenichi Hoshini. Do you know who I'm talking about? I'd have to see his work. I'm horrible at names. Do you know who I'm talking about? Just a really great, great artist. And and I think sort of has an illustration background out of New Mm -hmm. York. Um, you know, and 10 or 12 years ago, or maybe maybe longer, maybe 15 or so, mm-hmm. had some shows kind of through Portland or in Seattle, et cetera. And, you know, they were fairly affordable. And I'm just like, oh, I should have yeah. I should have bought that when I had the chance, you know. For sure. Um, yeah, it, it is that, that reg- I don't know, I that regret dwells on me a bit of like, oh, I should have bought this piece and um, even looking back at work where I'm like, I'll see stuff I did and I'm like, oh man, I can't even do that anymore mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. that was a different person who was, you know, maybe more fearless in this realm, in this area, you know, where they were able to take that risk. And maybe now I, I treat that specific part of the painting too precious or, or maybe vice versa, you know, like, oh, look, I kept that important. And I really like how that came out but i can't do that now i can't Mm -hmm. think that way it's like us as an artist looking back at work is interesting because you're like that person there was different they were a different artist doing different stuff that i i appreciate and hopefully i'm technically better just based on time you know but but there's things that are interesting in that that realm i had um uh, you, you know, you said like people from the UK will message you for interviews. Mm-hmm. I have random like high school students message me for interviews. And one of the questions is really interesting because they said, if you had a piece that a collector's like their house burnt down and they're like, can you give me this piece again? Like this exact piece from like 10 years ago or something. It's like, would you do it? Would you charge them? But you know, like there was a bunch of questions and I, th- I think it was, would you charge them? Would you do the same thing? I think those were like the two main questions. And for me, it was like, uh, depending on the collector, if it was like a one-off, right? Um, And so most likely I would redo something, you know, but I would never be able to replicate that exact thing, nor would I want to. Mm -hmm. It'd be my rendition of it today. Mm -hmm. So it's like, unfortunately, I couldn't do that exact same piece. Yeah, for sure. No, that's great. I mean, there are plenty of artists who would feel like they could, you know, or would try to. But Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not, you were talking, I mean, sort of the conversation, sort of just this idea that we are juggling so much as image makers Mm -hmm. in terms of the visual tools needed to develop, you know, an image on canvas that has certain qualities to it. And throughout your evolution, you're just focused on those different areas, you Mm -hmm. know, and that's understandable so things can't be replicated as you were right. just mentioning um all the time or or wouldn't want to be for sure um i certainly couldn't do you know i've seen some of my pieces from art school or soon after and like i couldn't i couldn't if i tried produce the same certain quality that it had mm-hmm. um maybe i have plenty of the facility but there's something there that would i just couldn't develop it the same way because i was a different person thinking thinking differently approaching the canvas differently yeah there's also like uh you know like as when you're young you're a lot of times you're more naive you're more ambitious you know like these things 
can influence a painting like like the young ambition of an artist can can take you in weird directions art wise as well as like career wise Mm -hmm. i think you were mentioning that earlier of like you being kind of i think you said naive or of how you kind of stumbled upon sure being mostly a gallery artist you know it was like Mm -hmm. uh, um and i think there is something interesting about that those initial phases of as pursuing art professionally kind of past college or wherever age you are when you start pursuing there is this young naive i'm gonna take over you know i have no one can tell me like even now or earlier when i said like it's there's not a lot of money it's like young naive me to be like yeah to you but i'm going to like succeed and i think there's a benefit to that as well of like of like it, it it's gonna take you down a road that you have no idea and you're probably gonna be very naive I mean, the young artists I meet, you can see them, see it in them. You know, they're like yeah. young and hungry. And yeah, like, that's, it. A, that's a great quality. I mean, just mm-hmm. to be sort of young and hungry and not necessarily know everything. Right. And I think that now that I get older and I have some experience under my belt and, you know, both good and bad um, mm-hmm. and had more time to think, I try to you know, that naivety that you're speaking of, of sort of youth, Mm -hmm. if you want to put it that way. Um, I try to just remain open, right? you know, and if I remain more open as a, as a, a, an adult to like what's possible, I feel Mm -hmm. like I keep some of that. What if could happen? You know, I mean, I, I, and I think that's, you know, I think that's really, that's sort of key to maintaining interest or maintaining work you know workflow if you want to put it that way in terms of just everything that's needed to develop a painting practice for sure uh so there's a little end part to the podcast i'm going to try to attempt it i don't remember half of the shit sergio asks we're already towards the end <laughs> yeah it's, wow. it's an hour can 40 I ask, seconds can i ask a yeah, question before you wow. do that yeah let's do it, yeah um I'm still obsessed with like your paintings that you have here with the birds. I've been, that's what I've been doing. I've been Mm -hmm. looking at your pieces. So Mm -hmm. you have the one where Mm -hmm. you've got like the birds eating out of a mouth, which (laughs) for me visually, it's just kind of like Mm horror-y. Sure. Um, Yeah, there's a little little grotesque there because it's unnatural. Yeah. 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 And like this is kind of similar, but I'm curious if that's the intention. No, I mean. Can I take a shot before you tell us what it? Do you know to which me, one? You to, know which one I'm yeah, talking yeah. about. To me, it, yeah. if 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 I break it down, it, it almost seems like the assumption is it's a hummingbird, and hummingbirds different um, painting. I think she's talking about. Oh. Well, I'm talking. Ta- that's one. also, okay. but I'm talking about like all the bird ones, like this one too. Oh. There's like a darkness to them, and they still seem. It's almost like in, like I said again, like in a fantasy film. Mm-hmm. It's almost like one of those like uncomfortable scenes that it's uh, beautiful, yeah. but it's like unsettling. Yeah, I think I think I'm always trying to have some tension mm-hmm. in a painting. Mm-hmm. And I don't sometimes I have a very clear idea of how to bring that and it may be there early on and then I get into painting it and, and the painting unfolds and I may have lost it or maybe I realize it's not as strong as I thought it was. Mm-hmm. And then in that painting in particular, um I think it's called Tooth and Claw. Um, and that yeah. she's holding another bird in her mouth. Right? Yeah, and is she taking it out or is she putting it in? I can't tell. Yeah. Are, are you asking me? That's that's that. Yes, I mean that, that's <laughs> that's some. To of, me, she's eating it. Like there she's you go. eating it. Like butt first. Yeah, yeah tail first. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that's the thing is I hmm. I looked at that painting as I was doing it and I felt she could be breathing it out one day and pulling it out of mm-hmm. her and freeing it mm-hmm. or trapping De- it. Right. Right. So that, you know, that painting went through a lot of different iterations um, in terms of color palette, subject matter, et cetera. Um, there's plenty of stuff I've just painted from my head and, and felt, you know, sort of a painting where I felt like that's what I needed to do in order to push it somewhere interesting. Um I get it. And it ended up coming out in a, in a very sort of a way that, yeah, I mean, I like the result of it. And it sort of led me thinking to other subsequent paintings 
Um, because I think it does have an, you know, it's a painting I look to where I, uh, I, even though, because I look at these paintings and I'm making them, I think I lose some of the punch or the, the impact that someone else would have who's just a viewer who's going to stumble upon it. Or I show something to my wife and she'll just, she'll really clue in on something that maybe I'm looking right past. Mm -hmm. But with that one, I just feel whenever I see it, yes, there's a, a, a nice sense of tension that I feel is important for mm -hmm. a painting to have. Yeah. I'm, uh, at least for my painting to I'm have. Curious. Uh, I, I forgot. I wanted to ask you about this, but it, it did just, our conversation didn't stumble upon it, but this kind of helps because the title of the piece called tooth and claw, it almost makes the piece dark as well to me. Like mm -hmm. the idea of tooth and claw means like it's almost, it's almost, based on the idea of struggle of the idea of like you, something pulling you one direction and you trying to go the opposite. So it, to me, it almost implies that the bird wants to go one direction and the human wants it to go the other direction. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but your titles, that's one thing that like, I, I have like this weird love for titles to paintings um, that are good. And I really liked your titles, uh, like w looking at your work and kind of seeing the title, um, attached to it. And, mm -hmm. and, um, how, does that, your process for creating a title, is that based around kind of the end result? It seems like a lot of people have like an overall narrative they're trying to accomplish. And sometimes some people, and maybe you're both or whatever, but a lot of times it's almost like a title is an afterthought based upon what they've come to and, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. of. Yeah. I, I used to think that way and I really do have to thank my wonderful wife, Tara, for mm -hmm. she's a poet and a writer and the importance of language mm -hmm. and, and really kind of coming to the idea that it, it isn't a title is very important, especially mm -hmm. with, with what I'm doing. Um, and so maybe 10 years ago of just really taking them, seeing them as an opportunity mm -hmm. to spin the image maybe in an unexpected direction mm -hmm. or add weight to it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think a lot about my title. So yeah. when I'm painting, I never, I mean, I, most of the time I don't have a title in mind of my painting mm -hmm. and because the, it may switch directions a few times as I paint mm -hmm. based on painting imagery in and painting it out. And, right. you know, every time you, you create a new relationship there. So how you feel or what's going on can really change. But I write down snippets of things I'm reading mm -hmm. or a snippet of a song or I'll kind of write this stuff down as I'm moving through that painting. Mm -hmm. And I do just keep a running list of, of that relate to the ideas I'm dealing with and sort of the, the back to sort of some of the reading that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I just keep a running list of titles or they, and mo many of them don't even, aren't even like good enough to be titles or, mm -hmm. or interesting enough and need some further development. But I just keep that going as I paint. So I have, you know, a sheet on the wall in my studio mm -hmm. and I'll write something down. Maybe I'm listening to an audio book. Maybe I'm reading something. Maybe I've heard something offhandedly and I'll jot that down mm -hmm. and let that sit, you know? Right. Um, and, and then see where it lives in relation to some of the imagery and what needs to change. So yeah. I really, when I come across artists too, I, I really, they're artists that I really enjoy, they're bringing everything to your visual experience. They're mm -hmm. bringing something, they've clearly thought about the title, the paintings are working, mm -hmm. you know, any kind of written statement whether it's about a specific body of work or just their work in general, that's mm -hmm. sort of there. I really like, I look at it all and, and mm -hmm. see them all as sort of possibilities to both communicate what I'm doing and then have other people connect right. because someone may need as much as I want everyone to walk up to one of my paintings and just sit with it for a while. I don't want them reading anything. The title is, is enough. Mm -hmm. Um, I just want someone to have that visual experience. I think 
Um, I mean, as much as I love titles and feel they're important, I think some of the writing that's where people are almost making paintings to justify their writing mm -hmm. that you see in a lot of, you know, a lot of different programs and out kind of in the art world. Right. And then you read the statement, it doesn't seem like it has any connection to the paintings and that right. sort of world that exists. Um, yeah, I, I would... think some of that's really important for certain people. Like certain mm -hmm. people are just going to, some people can sit with the image, some people the image and the title, right. other people need a little bit more something. So I usually have a short statement mm -hmm. or short something just to get them picking up some of the things that I'm drawing upon mm -hmm. um, and giving it a little context yeah. and, and interplay between what I'm doing. But ultimately, it's about the image, you right. know, and about the title that's happening. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think there are for sure many different ways to utilize a title without having to draw the attention away from the painting. I think I almost think of it similar to like an Easter egg in a movie or something, you mm -hmm. know, like that, like mm -hmm. little detail that kind of either ties something up for you or like it could be a clue that helps you, you know, someone that's not super proficient in reading artwork or something kind of guide you a bit, give you like the first breadcrumb to take you on the, the pathway that might help you at least get somewhere. Yeah. And I think that's, that's why I, I, I like them so much. It's not necessarily like it's the most important thing, but I think when I see someone utilize it, I really appreciate it. I go like, okay, that's cool. Cause you know, although you can take a painting any which way you want it, it is also appreciated as the viewer to kind of see what the artist's intent is. You know, I, mm -hmm. I do also enjoy that. So even though I can take this painting and, and connect it with my life experience or whatever, and see what I want to see, I also do appreciate seeing like, okay, the artist intended this. And now I can kind of enjoy this painting a second time or, or whatever. Um, or maybe it just makes you think about it a yeah. slightly differently. I think yeah. it definitely is a way to expand mm -hmm. what what's going on with your experience. For sure. It's yeah. the hardest So thank you for thing. saying that. Yeah. I appreciate that. Or like uh, even going back to like dark comedy, it's like you can literally title it something and your piece going from being a tragedy can now be that can be the punchline to your humorous. dark humor. Yeah, of yeah. A, it's just you can utilize it literally any way you want. But it's just an extra like tool, I think, that is interesting in yeah, it's it needs time I mean, but it what I've learned, mm -hmm. not being the strongest writer, mm -hmm. so I mm -hmm. took Latin in high school because I wasn't the strongest writer. Mm -hmm. So I could understand the the I just wish derivation I could... of all the words, you know, mm -hmm. like where are words derived from and, and how they relate to the romantic languages. So you can learn a little bit about that. Um it takes a lot of it takes a lot, you know, so that, that to me is another area of where mm -hmm. you're talking about like promotion and, and all the business side right. and then just carving out studio time. Well, if you start to feel, you know, as I do that, that, that needs to be something that's considered as well. It's like, okay, I need to fit that in. Mm -hmm. So I need to build time into developing that quality of the work since mm -hmm. I'm making it a quality of the experience, you yeah. know, and that, that's, you know, it's like, where do you find all the time? It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. You know, but it is, I mean, it, it also helps sometimes let the viewer know that there's more to this thing, mm -hmm. you know, which yeah. you might not get, or I don't know. I just think, but it, it is interesting hearing your process. Cause I think I have a very similar process of like the basics, the, the, the basic idea of the painting kind of has this like, all these words attached to it. And it, it, I do find a title usually at the end that like seems to just kind of click in mm -hmm. somewhere near the end or close to the end or maybe even midway. And then it helps me finish the painting sometimes. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you're thinking about it. Well, yeah, I, yeah. I don't, it, and if you just don't consider it, then mm -hmm. even it's sort of functioning on maybe even like a subconscious level, your right. brain's mulling things over. That's mm -hmm. not even happening for someone who just will title it, you know, untitled 81, right, untitled right. 82, et cetera, yeah. which is fine. That yeah. may function for their approach. But for, for sure. me, with what I'm doing, I really do see it as like, 
something I've had to develop and wanted to develop. And fortunately, you know, my wife Tara has been really good about just expanding my idea of mm-hmm. what it could actually bring to the painting. That's you know? awesome. Well, it's like naming a film, right? Like you have to make sure, like I can't, for whatever reason, like Kill Bill is one of my favorite movies. You have to think of the fact like that movie could be named a billion other things, mm-hmm. but, but Kill Bill is like. But I think I think with film, they have the advantage of having actual story. Story, yeah. Like you have, we have one image to explain something or potentially explain something, and it's like. Well, we don't get to write a book about this. We don't right. get to write a script about this. We so there's like the, these minimal things that can help a viewer, in my opinion, get to where you hope they might end up or somewhere near it or wherever. Right. To explain that, there's some genius in the brevity though of just Kill Bill. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah like there's sure. some there's something there that so to me where I feel like. I need to go explore all this stuff. Like I would want to look into, you know, how does it relate to the film as I see it? And then what was the, you know, director's intentions or the writer's intentions? And then how does it function maybe on a symbolic level or, you know what I mean? In Mm -hmm. terms of breaking it apart to understand it's made an impact on you. Why? Mm -hmm. Because there's something going on there that that seems interesting. Um, So whenever I have something like that, I'm like, Ooh, I need to unpack it Mm -hmm. and figure it out. Um, but yeah, titles. I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, uh, so let's try to wrap wrap it up. Let's try to do these <laughs> quick questions sure. by Sergio. Okay. I know the first one we usually ask is, do you do you have a or your top five artist alive? We used to do top five dead or alive. Mm-hmm. So Jadakiss lyric, but uh, we've changed it to top five artist alive. I don't know if you have a list or. This is one they should probably ask people pre. Yeah, yeah. Give them, give them some time to, <laughs> yeah. to dissect it a little. Now, no, really. there's, there's so many wonderful painters. It mm-hmm. to me, I, I don't like an entire painter's body of work, whether right. they're modern or, or sort of contemporary or historical. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, that's just where my sensitivities sort of lie. Um, but I, people, you know, it's like Neo Rausch is do does amazing stuff, mm-hmm. and he, you know, I think. If you just want to think about the whole Leipzig school in Leipzig, Germany, like mm-hmm. there's a tremendous group of painters who've come out of there who, you know, they're very skillful, but also very unique in their personality as a painter and sort of what they're doing with paint. So it's like, I just look at maybe that movement, I sort of put them on a pedestal because I think they're all, you know, there's Matthias Vischer and there's um, David Schnell and there's... I'm just Neil really Rausch and there's like all these people that that I really respect for what they do and and you know but I there's an underlying connection to them right 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 um that I sort of admire more in terms mm-hmm. of like how they're being an artist and what their subject matter is that I'm really attuned to it's like a scene it definitely is a scene and if you listen to them in their interviews they would they would agree that mm-hmm. it's that it's a little bit like that but in terms of you know I I certainly feel like I've got a lot of, um, what's the word, kind of, I feel connected to a lot of things that are actually happening in like Eastern Europe, Mm -hmm. Middle Europe with Germany and and some in France with some painters who are there and I couldn't name them all. Mm -hmm. Um, But I just feel like my aesthetic and what's represented well in terms of the galleries there, in terms of that work being shown, I certainly feel like my work fits in in that sort of world. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of actually, you know, where I'm would look to push into is mm-hmm. sort of making connections there. Yeah, um, like what's his name? Milo something. I think like the, those, that group of guys, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. I don't know. Um, I'm horrible. I realized after I asked you this question, I was like, you know, this works better with Sergio because yeah. he's so much better at names than I am. Yeah. I mean, that, that would be helpful. I mean, right now I'm just like, I would probably tell you, three or four artists that I've just maybe been reading about lately. However, I feel about their work. Maybe I don't entirely know, but there's mm-hmm. something about it that I like. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, there's an artist named Alexander Tinai or Tinay. I don't know quite how mm-hmm. to say his name. And he's like, 
he's from Moldova and he's, you know, working out of, I think, Budapest or, you know, and, and like, I really enjoy, I'm sort of reading about him and sort of seeing his, his arc, his, his life arc and mm-hmm. kind of what's influenced him and why. And I like a lot of his paintings and, you know, I, I but that comes to mind because I'm just maybe immersed in that versus someone who I'm like, oh, I love, you know, it's like, I love Gerhard Richter, some of what mm-hmm. he's done, you know, and I like certain people for all different reasons. I tend to, to cherry pick little qualities from like a broad mm-hmm. base of, of artists. And, yeah. and then the ones that are really impactful, um, you know, I, I guess it's for me, maybe individual paintings versus mm-hmm. artists. Mm-hmm. I think that's in general with artists. I mean, in any category, you know, like I think you're a musician, you're going to have your favorite album, you know, you're, your artist, every artist, I think, has like their their great paintings, and then they have the in betweens or something like that. I mean, but in terms of historically, you know, Manet, Degas, mm-hmm. um, I mean, those two kind of come to mind right away. And then I look to other people, like poets like Rilke as mm-hmm. well, who are very influential to my work. And then, you know, I've been reading a lot more philosophy in the last couple of years, and so some of those folks would be you know, they'd be who I would put up there as artists, but they wouldn't necessarily need, would necessarily be visual artists. For sure. Um, but, you know, I have I think, a co- let's give a couple of people who I, you know, Vincent Desiderio, mm-hmm. I think does some really great work. Um, I'm so bad with names. And I'm, I'm, Bo Bartlett, I think does really great work. And I like sort of what he, he sort of plays with in his subject matter and themes. You know, so those are two, you know, I think they're both in their 60s, and those mm-hmm. are two people who I look to and have worked with a little who have given me a little bit of that template mm-hmm. to living a creative life. Um, and I guess just on that point, another, uh, you know, there's a, a writer, an artist named Sharon Loudon. Have you heard of, of her? And she wrote a book called, um, I think it's called Living and Sustaining a Creative Life. Mm-hmm. And I would just encourage anyone who's she trying have a to podcast too? i think she might she certainly she runs things out of the new york academy of fine art i believe I I um, or the new york academy of art i forget exactly which one it is mm-hmm. or what the what the school is um but she's someone who just is saying is breaking apart the myth of like the mm-hmm. artist and how you function and you need to define it by your own terms and term right. and kind of leaning in a little bit with what you were saying john wentz was experiencing in in Paris Mm -hmm. um, about how like they see artists and like for how artists are are finding their own successes and what that means to Mm -hmm. be successful. So I think that's a a good book just to kind of broaden your eyes if you're someone out there who is trying to wade into the waters and figure it out and understand that like you need to find your own success. Um, Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Go back to the questions. I was sort of hijacked. Oh, no, no, no. That's, that's why we do it so we can go maybe little direction. points yeah. that we didn't touch on. The conversation always expands past the top five. It's yeah. always like little mini conversations. Um, I can't remember. I don't. It's like, what would you do with David Cho money? Oh, yeah. What would you do with David Cho money? Yeah, that's one. It's based around the idea of like, do you have a, do you have a project that you wish you could do, but financially doesn't, your finances don't allow you to kind of, produce this grand idea or something like that yeah do we need if we talk about our little secret ideas <laughs> does it give them less weight yeah um yeah, i guess i guess uh i don't i kind of think you know staying motivated and i know david mm-hmm. chose you know he's doing what he's doing but in terms of like for me being in his position it's just very hard to judge like you know right. his what's his like Staying motivated at that point right. could be very challenging. So I don't know if I had that much money, I, I don't know what I would do. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe create an art center and mm-hmm. and have a range of interactions from students to like people who are trying to be professionals, right. have some right. studios, create a space where um, things can be shown, you know, build a residency. I'd probably put like an organization together mm-hmm. ultimately so that it can help others and then also sort of fund or, or sort of fuel my own endeavors. I mean, for mm-hmm. me, 
I guess part of something that I'm really thinking about a lot is bringing some of what's happening in the painting into the physical space, so into like mm-hmm. the three-dimensional space mm-hmm. and how can I do that? Mm-hmm. So, you know, I have a show, I have a, a, sh- a show coming up in March of 2020 and that's what I'm really sort of working on right now. And I'm trying, I'm seeing if this is even feasible, right. you know? I mean, I would need to probably like 3D, I'm thinking like, oh, I need to learn some 3D printing. I need to do some sculpting. Mm-hmm. I maybe need to hire someone who can do certain um parts of the process to right. make like the electrical f- or something like yeah that. exactly electrical work yeah. of some kind so i'm starting to think like i would love to do this but just that alone there's four different working parts i named mm-hmm. and there's even more yeah. so it's like how can i spend the time to dedicate to the painting and that work and then also bring in this extra component so mm-hmm. that's that's for me my if i had some money that hurdle would be much easier to, mm-hmm. to handle where I could just pass something off to someone to say, okay, right. I need build me this kind of table because I'm mm-hmm. going to turn it into an art piece in a certain way. Mm-hmm. Right. Something along cool. those lines to yeah. give, to give sort of, I have a very similar problem. Yeah. Uh, but, but well, I, you know, I s- still feel it's a challenge and, yeah. and I have limited resources, but I still feel like I'm at least going to edge in that direction a little bit mm-hmm. and see, see what happens yeah. and at least sort of push the envelope of what I'm doing to at least incorporate some of it, even mm-hmm. though it may not be as grand as I envision right now. Mm-hmm. Right. And then next time it'll be that much easier. Yeah. And, and that's, that's what I'm hoping is, is like progress mm-hmm. versus like perfection, you know? Oh, yeah. Awesome. Uh, do you remember any other questions? I'm so. Well, yeah. Sergio is the one that's. He does oh. like these like, uh, <laughs> Where he names artists and gets your first take. Mm. Oh yeah, there what's, was like what's the other one. You Frida Degas. Uh, okay, so we'll just Picasso. go through. So we'll do artists, and then we'll see your like f- your like guttural reaction your quick, to them. Quick, like res- <laughs> op- opinion or Spitfire. Yeah, I do like I, I like that Spitfire idea. For me, it's very much like again, it's it's a if you could show me a painting, uh-huh. I right. could give you a quick take. Versus if right. you talk about like Frida Kahlo, like the first right. thing I think of is her her desire to to be a visual artist within all those complications of her life Mm -hmm. and how empowering that is Mm -hmm. that's perfect right so um as opposed to specific work and and what's going on Mm -hmm. you know i think i think that's kind of our his goal Mm -hmm. uh, uh, with the quick it's more like the uh or you could even just be like they suck. They're good. It's, it's, yeah, no, I, it's, it's I, I think like, I think what the questions are getting to is um, is really interesting and to demystify mm-hmm. historical painters or just painters nowadays. I, yeah. you know, I often think saying, you know, kind of having a, an opinion on artists should be as easy as we have opinion on music. Right. It seems like everyone's very quick to say, I don't like this or, or I like this kind of music. Right. But for some reason, there's like a sensitivity around saying yeah, that with, with artists. And yeah. I sort of feel like maybe some of the pedestals we've put historical artists on bleed into our modern times. Oh, yeah. And sort of, you know, these people were just like us. And I think that that, mm-hmm. you know, I think anyone who's trying to be a painter and sort of has these icons in their head should really peel back the layers and look into who they were as people Mm -hmm. and sort of demystify, um, definitely the cultural significance that sort of way that just sort of dropped on us of Mm -hmm. like, Oh, you know, we've been beaten over the head with impressionist shows in every museum since we were kids. And so everyone kind of has the general opinion of like, Oh, those, those, those artists were good. Right. That's never, you know, that's never really happened before. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I think it's, it's, it's interesting to, to see who these people were and then just come to your own opinions of where they are and make yeah. it a little more casual. I guess yeah. like someone can say that my art is terrible. I'm okay with that. Right. Like yeah, that's exactly. your opinion. Just like if, you know, you don't like, Britney Spears. I mean, that's right. a dating. Even, that's dating me. I know. Like, it's like you know, in terms of like, yeah. it's like country music. Yeah. There you go. Like I people are like, so quick to say, yeah. oh, I, I just heavy metal sucks or right. whatever. Right. Whereas they wouldn't say, you know, I mean, name some super famous artist and right. like, yeah, you know, right. Pollock or something or, or yeah, or a Basquiat. It's like, yeah, I can't have opinion on that. 
But there's something that seems a little taboo about that, yeah. doesn't there? And, and I think that's... that's. And there's even uh, a point to be made about, for instance, a movie, right? Um, at, in its time, could have been groundbreaking and mm-hmm. amazing. But I might watch that movie today and go like, oof, yeah. special effects are really visible to mm-hmm. me and it is distracting. And that's why I don't like this movie. Mm-hmm. And I think you can have both opinions. You can have the opinion of like, I can understand that this uh, this movie was important during that time and it's why there's movies nowadays that are crazy, special effects, you know? But looking at it now, it doesn't have that. So I don't like it because of that. Mm-hmm. I can still appreciate its effect on the modern day, um, like uh, where we are in, a, in mm-hmm. this current day, but I can still have an opinion of how I think it's good or bad or clunky or whatever. You know, it's like th- that opinion is valid mm-hmm. and it's not disrespecting what, what importance it had in history. Yeah. And I think a lot of times that gets confused in art because it had this very important, um, uh, breakthrough in art for that time. We have to pretend or, or we can't say that we don't think it's good mm-hmm. in the present time. It might feel clunky nowadays or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I just think you're speaking to life is nuanced and mm-hmm. we live in shades of gray. Right. And that's, to me, I revel in that, yeah. you know, and that's the beauty of it all. For Whereas, sure. you know, I think obviously with social media and some of the things that are happening nowadays, which is the, which is an entirely different conversation, mm-hmm. you know, it's a little bit more stark one side or the other. Whereas like, no, there's gray is great and this is where we live and it's nuanced right. and, and humans are complex For and sure. communicating is complex. And yeah. like that should be celebrated and improved and and worked upon if it's if the communication isn't working and not like um not i get the only thing i think of is just terms of not um shying away from maybe living in those spaces right you know i mean we're all incredibly complex yeah or there there's this weird like i don't know instant i i don't think it exists mo- in the art like the people who really geek out about art are really in this world but you you can hear a celebrity who will some i don't know like let's say banksy right gets brought up and someone will go like oh that guy is a genius and you couldn't they couldn't answer why but for some reason i think they think there's some some i don't know special um social points because they are aware of an artist who seems to be probably the biggest artist living today. And so since they're aware of him and they think he's a genius, all of a sudden they get to pat themselves on the back and go like, Mm. I'm in the know Mm -hmm. that this artist is genius. And it's like, but you don't know if he is because you don't know how to explain. You don't, you can't explain why he is. But well, you, then you take you either take the time because you like this person and help them expand their right. their mind and ideas, or 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 hopefully they're interested enough to look into it and, right. and unpack why they like it as well, yeah. versus just being um, something to say. Yeah. You know. But I, I, what I'm trying to point out is that I it's kind of like I think someone's talked about someone putting a cell phone on the floor in an art gallery and then people circling in and saying it's genius, but it's like this idea of um kind of hope trying to be like i know what's going like that that it it exists in human in general like the you know like if you go to music and it's like i like this artist because no one knows who they are Mm -hmm. the second they become known oh they're pop they're mainstream i'm not into it it's like this i'm on the the knowing i know what's 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 in or what's what's hip or whatever it's there's this weird urge humans have. And yeah, isn't it just everyone trying to find their group, you know, yeah. like they want to find some place to identify For with. Sure. And it, you know, that's like in our twenties, like we're messy and figuring that out, yeah. you know, and that's fine. Yeah. You know, I mean, everyone's just doing that really constantly of like finding where they land on things and who, who they can align themselves with and who they can't you know so some of that cultural capital you're speaking to of mm-hmm. of knowing an artist it's like great at least they care enough you know if they're not in the arts at least they right. care enough to like at least keep an eye peeled for something that's happening and maybe that conversation can move in an interesting direction after that 
Way to be an optimist. <laughs> I guess I'm forever an optimist. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Awesome. Well, we did it. Uh, we didn't do the rapid fire. Bob Ross? Oh, yeah. That's his last one. He usually asks. I'll just ask that one. <laughs> what I have there is is coming into a room and seeing my dad watching Bob Ross. And not he's not a painter, mm-hmm. you know, Um but my dad watching Bob Ross and I certainly would stick around for five or 10 minutes and just kind of see what he's doing and how he's doing. And, and the fact that he's moving through a whole painting and, you know, an edited 30 minutes or whatever. Right. Um, it's great. Like whatever, you know, I'm sure Bob Ross has been influential for a ton of people. For me, it's just like conjuring a memory from Mm -hmm. my childhood, you know, and, and saying, Oh, you know, that's, that's was good for what it was then you know right. i don't really make a judgment on his art because he's he's trying to educate and do something a little different than what i'm doing so mm-hmm. you know he was he was successful at it he's definitely had a resurgence lately for sure awesome it that made me think why isn't there like an art channel like a cooking right. channel mm-hmm. where they like start a painting and then they pull it out of the oven and it's finished painting <laughs> mm-hmm. i'm like oh look what we got uh, Is, isn't that what instagram lives for now right? i suppose yeah, yeah yeah what time lapses are or youtube <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know Absolutely. no that's good i mean as much as you know as 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 sort of simplified and sort of kind of be a catch-all of people's interest as, uh-huh. as that was you know, it probably did lay a foundation to then people putting up their, their painting process on a YouTube video, mm, you know? Sure. I mean, I've certainly shared snapshots, mm-hmm. you know, as mm-hmm. I've moved through a painting and, you know, there's, that's fascinating. Like yeah, the yeah. creator process is fascinating. So mm-hmm. however you can relay that to someone who's interested, if you want to do it, great, relay it. Yeah, you especially know? if you're like a, a kid t- trying to teach himself. Exactly. Those are like those things you hyper-focus on. You're like, mm-hmm. what's going on here? Yeah, it's it's oh. it's an outlet. So I'm um, I'm definitely more thumbs up than thumbs down on Bob Ross. Yeah, awesome. Sorry, Sergio, for not <laughs> for doing getting your quick all the fires. <laughs> he should probably have a, like a little form where he just and I just read it off. But eh, that's no fun. Whatever. <laughs> uh, but thanks a lot, man. Really appreciate you doing this. It's been a blast. Yeah, yeah. this was awesome. Thank you. For uh, if anyone wants to find your social media is, I can't remember. It's uh, Studio Flint. Studio Flint. All one word on Instagram. And that's really the only place I'm at. Okay. You know, okay. I think there's a Tumblr. I don't know how active it is. Every I don't do anything else. Uh-huh. I, I don't do Facebook or yeah. any other stuff. So just my website or Instagram is always a good place to go to. Awesome. And we'll shout you out. So and he, and you, you. you have shows coming up? Yeah, I have a solo show in March. Oh, and, nice. and you know, I'll, I've will i got to finish the work and get it photographed. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, I think there's a couple of the smaller pieces or little snippets of pieces that I'll be showing in that show that are on my Instagram feed or whatever. Nice. Where's um, that at? It, Robert Lang Studios in Charleston, South Carolina. Nice. So they're, they're my life. I've been a... I've had a good relationship with them for awesome. a long, long time. Cool, cool, They're cool. Great. Well, thanks again, man. Thank you. Um, Just adding to the narrative of cool Josh's. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Way to wrap it. Way to bring it around. Um, uh, no, it's very, it's very nice to you guys to have me on. I appreciate it. Awesome. I'm a p- huge podcast fan, so like, you know, this has been really fun and interesting for me. Hell yeah. Uh, this has been waiting, Jai. If you're still listening, fuck off. <laughs>